crazy times, the world just needs a hero to help cut through all the noise. Well, now you have two. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to yet another episode of Your Heroes of Noise. I'm one half of this dynamic duo. My name is Steve. Hey, what's going on, everybody? My name is Dan, and welcome to episode 117. It's going to be a beautiful day. A lot of times, special things happen on this show, and this is going to be one of those times. Because, Steve, you there, Steve? Can I talk to you for a second? Please. Yes, I'm here. We have a very, very special guest. I don't know if you recall this or not, but the very first time that we recorded on this show, you would ask me, hey, Dan. And I said, what, Steve? And you said, what kind of podcast are you listening to? And I said, oh, I am. I'm listening to one right now. I'm actually, I don't remember what I said, but the, but the important part of this, Steve, is that I said I was listening to a podcast called Startcast. Yes. And I was. And it was weird because I hadn't even discovered like pop culture leftovers yet or anything. I just happened to, I don't even know how I found it. It must have been the algorithm that I was on or something, but Startcast popped up. Started listening and the man's got a voice of, of a majestic eagle if they had voices wow, soaring, soaring over the skies. And he's, and he's a great conversationalist. I got to meet this person. What? In Chicago, I swear to you, I'm telling you the truth. Back in Chicago, what seems like about 95 years ago, <laughs> I got to meet him. I don't even remember what he looks like. It's been so long. First time guest, I'd like to introduce Joe Stark from the Stark cast, as well as number one comic books. What's going on, Joe? Hey, I'm so happy to be here, guys. <laughs> happy to have you, dude. That was an amazing introduction. I, <laughs> it made me feel like, oh, God, I'm not worthy of this. <laughs> You're like, fucking chill out, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> we have the man on the show, bro. This is crazy. Yeah, yeah. It's good stuff, man. We're going to have a good time today. I don't even know. I thought I would keep it kind of loose. I know that we've all watched one or two things without even really having to like line it up. But these are these kind of shows when we have such a good guest. And again, I'm sorry to put the pressure on you, Joe, but I know you. And I've heard your show and other people have heard your show. So I feel confident in saying you're a great conversationalist, man. So I'm looking forward to talking to you. Letting the Heroes of Noise listeners know who the hell Joe Stark is. Oh, I'm so excited to talk to you guys and legit. I've been nervous all morning because, you know, I mean, here was a noise. You guys are one of my favorite podcasts and oh man, thank you, man. I mean, it was so cool getting to meet you at C2E2 and then having you on Startcast. and I'm going to put Hudson on the spot because I got the opportunity. I would love to have you on Startcast sometime, dude. Oh, for sure. For sure. <laughs> oh, yes. bro. What are you talking about? <laughs> I want to hear that shit. I would love to hear that. <laughs> oh, that's right. You want your show is going to dig deep into the. <laughs> this is what I've been planning for years because I can't seem to get to the creamy center, Joe, of the Tootsie Pop. And I'm thinking, how many, you know, that, remember that commercial? How many licks does it take? A one, a two, a three, crunch. A yeah. A two, a three. <laughs> now, this sounds gross. And I, I know I put myself in these situations, but I've been looking at that shit for about three and a half years wow, now. That's... And I can't, I, you know what? I put myself in that position. Dude, I, I, I do, dude. I just beat you to it. I won't even, I, I, there's no reason reason for me to say anything i'm so basically on. saying i've been filleting you but i'm not yes, saying that at all <laughs> pretty much yeah but anyway i've been this is, i think this would be a perfect opportunity steve for you to go on there maybe i'm scaring you now but joe is like the barbara walters of podcast i hear it in his voice he really is <laughs> i do and i think that's a good thing as long as you like barbara walters if not just fill in the person you respect and that's who you are joe. <laughs> barbara walters you remember she used to make everyone cry yeah <laughs> that was yeah like, except, except eddie eddie didn't cry Eddie, oh, Eddie Murphy? Yeah, he didn't cry. He's a sociopath, Steve. Wow, well, okay, I did not know that. Well, I'm, I can't wait to, because I know uh, <laughs> Dan seemed like he had gone to the uh, psychiatrist when he got back from doing your show. I was like, dang, you guys just <laughs> talked about your life for three hours. <laughs> Dude, that's what people always say afterwards. They're like, I feel like that was like a psychiatry session. It's like, yeah, I, I've, I've always been the type of person to where, I can just walk up to somebody that I don't know and just start talking to them. And now at almost 40 years of age, I've really realized that that doesn't always go well, <laughs> Dude. at least in person. But, um, but then I mean, start is it's, it's always fun to record. And, um, it, it's one of those ones to where I, I don't have a very good schedule with it. It comes out really sporadically and it, it's, it's mostly the result. Of, I just, I always have too many irons in the fire. Mm -hmm. And, and so it's, it's one of those ones where it's like, I want to be in a good, a good, a good mental place to be able to really talk with somebody when we record it. And, yeah. and dude, I'd be so stoked to, to have you on. I, I think we could have some great conversation. Oh, for sure. And, dude, um, there's no question. 
Yeah, I mean, because, you know, I mean, you reveal bits and pieces of yourself in your life on the show. And it, and it's fascinating stuff. Like, I, I'd love to talk with you more about, uh, like, music and, and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, mm-hmm. Because you said you play the bass and stuff, right? Learning. Learning to play the bass, yes, with the, with the help of folks like Bucks, yes. <laughs> nice. When I was in middle school, so in fifth and sixth grade when they introduced band, uh, we all had to test for all the different uh, instruments that we could play. And I really wanted to play the drums. And they were like, no, you'd be great with a trombone. And so I got okay. stuck with okay. a trombone for like a year and a half or so before I threw in the towel. But I learned how to read um, uh, bass clef notes. Mm-hmm. And so when I got to seventh grade, the band instructor was the high school jazz band instructor also. Mm -hmm. And he knew that by the time I got to high school, his bass player was going to be leaving. And so he was trying to get me to play the bass. And so I I did that long enough to kind of learn from him and then realize that I didn't want to play jazz. And so I quit that. But, um, so I, I messed around with the bass a little bit. Like I could read tablature at at this point and stuff and, you know, just kind of mess around. Nothing very fluid. I don't think I'd be able to play (laughs) in a band or anything like that but it's one of those instruments that's just super fun to play around with have a bass not anymore um oh no uh what's funny is that like that was when i was first learning it that was my mission in life i was like i must get a bass guitar but i was just this kid living in rural iowa you know and it's like what i could get a paper route and do that for like an entire summer (laughs) yeah and it's like i I never wanted to get up early and then my grandpa tells me about this guy that's running a fruit and vegetable stand along the highway and he needs people to help him and so i spent a good month or two working for this crazy one-legged guy Hmm. holy cow yeah and like he was an interesting character he drove a light blue el camino nice (laughs) and he owned this farm outside of town that had pigs in it and so my job quickly went from working at the vegetable place to feeding all the rotten vegetables to his pigs. I heard pigs are very smart. And did you get attached to them a little bit? No, not at all. all right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Pigs are assholes, Steve. <laughs> okay, so get this. It's in Iowa and uh-huh. it's in the winter yes. and it's in an unheated barn. And I have to go in there and clean out the stalls. So mm. like you use a pitchfork to shovel out all the wasted straw that's covered in pig shit and piss and when you would put the pitchfork through it it would crunch because the top layer was frozen and then you'd flip (laughs) it over and all the steam would rise up from it and my glasses would get covered in condensation (laughs) and i was keenly aware of the fact that all this condensation was from pig's bowels oh Oh, wow how old were you i think i was 16 15 or 16 i was just old enough to drive so it was probably 16 and but like every time that happened i was like counting down the paychecks in my mind it's like you have to work this long until you can buy that ibanez bass that's at the guitar yes. loft <laughs> yeah and so you ended up you actually saved the money spent it all on the ibanez yes holy cow. and did you stop working or you kept working no i immediately stopped working which was a mistake <laughs> oh my god because He's like, now i, I need an amp <laughs> exactly <laughs> <laughs> It's so hard to practice on an electric bass without an amp. <laughs> you didn't really think that one through, Joe. I didn't at all. And that's the, that's that's because 16-year-olds don't have fully formed frontal lobes. We do not think <laughs> – yeah, we do not. And the, and the funny thing is I bet you were like, well, watch this. You show your friends. Check out what I'm playing. And they're like, sounds like nothing. <laughs> Dude, I remember getting on the internet, and that was back in the dial-up days. Uh-huh. And finding some website that had Rage Against the Machines, I think first two albums, all listed out in tablature. And so I Ooh, learned a whole bunch of that. Cow. Dude, wow. you, you're making me not think that I love music like I do, because when I had dial up, I was not waiting for tablature to come up on the screen. <laughs> that was not what I was searching for. Dan, were you searching for tablature when the internet? Was you know, what? I have never, ever learned how to read music. So, no, that'd be a big hard no. Yeah, for me, I learned how to read music. About four or five years ago. That's all? Five. Oh, wow. yeah. Be- before it was just ears. It's just I could hear something and play it. Then after a while, uh, I remember hearing Harry Connick Jr. I went to like I went to like three of his concerts. And the last one I went to, he said, um, for all you students out there, because there was like a school that came to the concert. He's like, hey, guys, learn- I did it wrong. He said, learn how to read, learn the rules, and then learn how to break those rules. Got to learn what the rules are before you start breaking them. I should have done it like I was like, oh, 
he's freaking right. I don't even know. And so then I started learning music and figuring out, oh, this is why I do that thing I do that sounds right. It's because it's a, it's a very mathematic, music is, for someone, I hate math, and music is very mathematic. You know, the fact that musicians can read, like you read, reading bass tablature, there are so many things that are happening at once for you to play bass, reading bass tablature. You have to know the, the time signature. You have to know what key you're in. You have to remember that key because it's not going to remind you. And then when you see a, a natural, you got to automatic. Like so many things have to be working at once. So the fact that you used to play bass, you know, and, and read, dude, there's no way you shouldn't have a bass right now. That part of your brain is just chilling. <laughs> it was so long ago. <laughs> so what? It's just there, like it's just hiding with, dormant. <laughs> exactly with a with a tank top and a belly down, kind of <laughs> just watching TV, being like, I guess we're just not doing anything anymore, are we? <laughs> Looking like Fat Thor. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm just using my bass to open beers on. <laughs> exactly. So what happened to the Ibanez? Um. So then, since I didn't have. An amp, you know, yeah. I only practiced for so long without an amp. And then uh-huh. for a while it was just, you know, it was just leaning against the wall in my room. Mm-hmm. And then a friend of mine that uh, knew someone else that wanted to buy a bass just kept like writing my ass about, oh, you need to sell this. You need to sell this and just make some money off it. That's just money sitting in your room. And and so eventually I just got tired of him harping on me. I'm like, fine, I'll fucking sell it. But I got the same amount of money out of it that I put in i think it was just around 200 dollars because it was a used one to begin that's with. a lot of money when you're 16 dude oh it sure was <laughs> Gee, that's a lot i remember i could make 200 dollars last for a year and a half when i was 16 man that's how we know you grew up nice and straight edge you were able to save your money dude i saved <laughs> because i i, I hate like, working I dime hate bag it. here uh-uh. dime bag there i hated working that's probably what happened to that two hundred dollars. <laughs> you know what? You know it's funny when I was when I was sixteen, I probably spent most of that on cigarettes. Oh, I keep forgetting that you smoked. Yeah, that's probably what most of it went to. When did you start smoking, Steve? <sighs> maybe like when was the first time you took a drag of that 13. that magic magic stick? Maybe thirteen. Thirteen? Yeah, that sounds about right. You're getting yeah. a little bit uh, rebellious. You're yes. stepping out of your comfort zone. And you're not inhaling. You're just... If you do, what? you're you're fucking choking. Oh, dude. <laughs> and the funny thing is, it's still addicting, even if you don't. Because I needed them immediately the next day. Immediately, dude. We all would go down to the creek and we'd all smoke. And then after that... All I love that friends, you all went down to the creek. We did. And, <laughs> That's just and, a nice little detail. Here's the funny part, dude. Okay, we went to the creek and, and all of them quit. And I kept on going. But... I went to the creek and I, I remember we used to always find porno mags in the creek. And I was like, wow, this is something that's very specific to San Luis Obispo. And then I was reading a book later. And in the book, they're like, you know how porno mags are always in creeks. So I was like, okay, that's a curious <laughs> like coincidence. Which- and then later on, I'm talking to a buddy in boarding school and he's just like, yeah, dude, my first thing of porn was like in Creek, someone threw him down. I was like, wait, <laughs> okay. is there some random like it clown that are just like, I know how to get these kids. I'm just going <laughs> to sprinkle porn all through these creeks. Yeah, I used to find porn in Creek beds. I have to Google Creeks and porn right now. <laughs> oh, it's over. You will, fi- dude, it's over. I guarantee you'll find it because that's where they put them in Creeks. And we'd take them home. We'd, we'd argue over who has what. Because before that, we used to think, you got babies by like, uh, it has something to do with the girl's butt for sure. <laughs> Doesn't? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. I've just been putting in extra work. <laughs> I didn't know. It's, yeah. So yeah, that's a, but yeah, I, I don't think anyone to this day has enjoyed cigarettes as much as I did. Can I follow up with my search? Please. please. So I don't see anything about, you know, finding porn magazines in creeks. However, I think I might have just discovered a new genre of porn oh, because the very first search result is Pornhub and it says uh, creek porn videos. I'm afraid to click on this. <laughs> creek porn? Hey, y'all want to meet me down by the creek? Oh, that's <laughs> for sure what it is. I'm going to teach you where babies come from. <laughs> that's, that's for sure what it is, dude. Yeah, There's no I, question. I don't see anything about, about this uh, really? rash of porn sightings in, in the area, but I will keep my eyes open. Please do. The yeah. next time I'm at a creek, I'll definitely be having, you know, my blinders off but also i have a feeling that it's kind of not the reason that you don't see it now is because as soon as the internet started they know there's no need for creeks anymore yeah yeah when i was a kid the the stories were going around it wasn't by a creek but it was out in the woods 
Exactly. That see, that the, you know, kids would stash porn out in the woods, and I, I, I never found porn in the woods. But I remember I was friends with this kid, and his family bought this house and moved in. And when they were going through the attic, they found a whole box of like Hustler magazines from like the late seventies, no early eighties. No, nice. Hustler and Penthouse, like like the real. That's the real ones. deal. Yeah, that's yeah. Real. And like we were over there, and I remember there was this dope tree house in the backyard. And we were hanging out in his treehouse, and he was like, do you want to see something? And I'm like, what? <laughs> and he pulls out this giant box that had probably like two dozen porno mags in it. And like, I don't know, prepubescent Joe was like, <laughs> it was like seeing that much, you know, in late 70s, early 80s stuff. You know, there was no silicone or anything. And it's like, wow, that was like a treasure trove. Oh, that's when joe the, became a man all the hair you're just like wow it's hairy down there. yeah like, that's when that's when beaver hunt meant something you know what i mean <laughs> yeah and they yeah it had all like, i was the, really hoping somebody like, got that the, reference the that penthouse so letters and no i now dude as soon as you said beaver hunt, i remember the page <laughs> with all the polaroids on it that is so freaking i thought about that shit in years that's funny <laughs> Those penthouse forums, man. Those guys always had the best lives because that shit never happens in real life. You know that, right? So there I was working at the gas station. She pulled up. She was my last customer. I don't have any money, but I need a full tank of gas. I'll give you a full tank. And then you know how it goes. From <laughs> of course. And the funny, here's the sad part about me. I didn't know there was writing in penthouse. <laughs> Actually, that's pretty understandable. Depending on when you started looking. Yeah, because, I didn't even know there was writing. Yeah, <laughs> because you have to go to a certain point. Like, you can't just open up your first porno mag and be like, Oh my God, but look at these words, right? Like you're clearly focused on one thing. I remember oh, the first, sure. I remember the first time I, I found a porno mag, I was at my cousin's house and uh, <laughs> he goes, he goes, I said, I got to use the restroom, man. I had to, you know, I had to spend some time in there and he's like, oh, okay, cool. He's like, Hey, if you need extra toilet paper, look in this cabinet. And I went, okay, but you got some. He's like, yeah, but if you need some, <laughs> look in oh, the cabinet. That is awesome. And I'm like, ah, okay. Uh-huh. I don't know where he was going. I'm not stupid. But that was the most glorious stack of books that I've ever come across in my life. I think that my, uh, you know, I went in there to take a shit and I basically stayed in there for probably two and a half hours. <laughs> what I would imagine, so what, was he saying if you wanted Where's to jack off at? in in your bath? Is that what was he? That was that's what he was implying, right? Yes, yes, yes. That is so strange. That's why he didn't come. Like you know, like are you okay in there? <laughs> like it's that literally so been two hours. Nope, he's good. <laughs> He knew so you were just fine. Yeah. <laughs> Came out looking like I was in a sauna. <laughs> that is, you know, when you think about it, there was a lot of, I think I was way more comfortable with, like, because when there was just a bunch of dudes in a circle looking at porn and we didn't be like, is this weird? I think, I, I think it became, we Some almost stand by me shit right there. Yeah. And I was like, you know, that was, and it wasn't strange. We were just all sitting around looking at it whereas now you do that well no one would but if someone asked to be like hey check out this video i got and you look at it, you're like oh i'm not watching that with you like you know it became a i don't know what happened you literally had the 21st century experience of that already just recently in How your vr you? experience oh jesus dude your buddy's like hey you want to look into the no! library you said and nay that's, and that's <laughs> sad because when i was a kid i'd be like yeah let's go into your room and look <laughs> and now it's like, hey. So I got a question. Yeah. Who provided you your first pornography experience? An, an actual VHS tape? Uh, who provided it? Yeah. Like what oh, What was the setup? I don't man. want to know the results. I'm, I'm just no, curious. No, I'm trying to. I'm try, like that is. And do you remember a, the title? Because I sure do. That is so funny. I think I provided my own. Because I videotaped the squiggly lines on that weird channel. You talking about the uh, illegal cable box? Yeah, where it kind of made it almost like you could hear the you could hear the audio, and sometimes you could make a picture out. Like, oh, there's a nipple. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, I, I that. recorded that on VHS, and <laughs> so that was mine. No wonder you're so twisted, dude. Listen, because there's think about my circle, dude. There's no way. That, that's true. You know what I'm saying? But going yeah. to Adventist school, someone at the Adventist school is going to be like, dude, not going to believe what I got. No. How about you, Joe? It was over at my best friend's house and he had found a shoebox in his parents' closet that, that had a couple VHSs in it and a vibrator and some condoms and shit. <laughs> and so we all thought it was just the funniest shit that we were seeing. And there was stuff in there that had to have come from a bachelorette party because there was like 
uh, like like a thing that you could put like a drinking straw in, but it was shaped like a big pink veiny dick. <laughs> <laughs> we were just laughing our asses off at all this stuff. And then when we see the tapes, we're like, oh yeah, let's throw this in. And so we put it in and I, the, I don't remember the title of it, but I remember it was a, it was a younger dude banging an older lady and they were in like a, you remember in the, in the movie clue, how there was like the billiards room. Yep. They were, it is a set similar to that. And they were doing it on a pool table. And I remember he chalked up the cue and she was on the table with her legs <laughs> spread and he chalked up the cue. And I was like, no, no. And then he flipped it around and fucked her with the thick end of it. And she was like, Oh, you're so creative. <laughs> it's fucking weird. That shit's been in my head ever since. It's never fucking left. <laughs> we know where Joe's going after recording's done. He's going to go, hey, <laughs> go down memory lane. But I just remember be, having my mind so blown because it was like I was not ready to see triple X porn. Like I'd seen, you know, like Cinemax type stuff before that. And I thought that that was porn. And so seeing this stuff, it was You're like, whoa. Was, you know, that was the first time as a kid, like, no, like actually realizing like what sexual intercourse meant. And, you know, being a latchkey kid in the, in the early eighties, you know, I was hanging around older kids in the neighborhood. So I, I feel like I learned about all sorts of fucked up shit way before I should have. Yeah. I, I definitely saw that porno tape way younger than I should have as well. I wonder, is there like, is there proof that seeing it too young? Cause the worst it does is heightens your expectations. In my opinion. It gives you like, oh, this is how it's supposed to be. And then when it happens, you're like, that's not how it is at all in any way, shape, or form. I think if I would have grown up with the internet, oh, dude, oh, Lord, have mercy, bro. I think you're 100% right about that because it's like it does heighten your expectations. You're seeing like professionals get busy, right? Yes, yes, but exactly. on the flip, does it make you more of a G when you're starting out? No. Yeah, I don't think so either. I was just saying. No, 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 no. <laughs> now, what I will say is it's starting like as things, as technologies moves further, yeah. there will be kids that are, or young men and women that are like really good at what they do because they had fake stuff and it kind of prepared them for it. Us, we had no idea what it was going to feel like the first time. So when we did it, we're like, oh, interesting. This is a lot better than I thought it was going to be. You know what I'm saying? But if I would have been watching someone do amazing things, I would have been like, so when are we going to do that amazing thing? Isn't this when it, when it, when it happens, right? <laughs> but I did I, since I only had magazines, I didn't know what the crap was happening. So now I just wonder how kids are actually, you know, uh, you know, I, I wish I could talk to a, like once my son, you know, gets his, his, his first, I'll probably be like, so? Huh? <laughs> and he'll be like, I am not doing this with you. Today. That's think I think that's exactly what he's going to say. <laughs> <laughs> so like just so just to keep it fair, I'll tell my story. Like yeah. I was more like Joe because I was busy watching like um Emmanuel in Bangkok on uh remember that Damn, remember those? Dude, that was, yeah, dude, that was a long that wasn't that long ago. Skinamax, though, dude. It was a while ago. Maybe was it Skinamax or was it Showtime? Because they both had their share of after hours yeah, features. Dude, they had like a manual twenty eight. Yeah. So like I knew what was up with that stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course I told you about the experience I had at my cousin's house. So I, I was familiar with how things work, but I remember one day I'm sitting at, at home and you know how like you lie on your stomach and you watch TV. Yes. So I'm doing just that. And we, and we had one of those gigantic <laughs> console TVs, the kind that had legs and it was uh -huh. made of wood. You know what I'm talking about? Dude, those old that, ones? that yeah. became furniture. That yes. thing that weighed like 700 pounds. It just became a <laughs> coffee table when it didn't work. Anymore. Yeah. When it didn't work, you just put a sheet over it. You're and not put... moving that. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's exactly it. That thing is like, when you move it, you look at the, the carpet underneath, you're like, Jesus, this has not been touched. Yeah. It, what was it called? It was like the vertical holding or something like that. It would start flipping on you. And you're like, damn it. Dog, no, listen. Anyway, we're not going to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the that pain was, of my existence. Because we were all, the youngest is always the one that had to get up and be like, hey, adjust that. Then you're like, Jesus. <laughs> so there I am, right? I'm laying there <clears throat> and I'm watching whatever. I'm watching something that's non-related. And I look underneath the space of the, of the TV and I see a VHS like, it's just not hidden at all, basically. Yeah. <laughs> it's just right there. And I'm like, what is this? Why is the box blue? That's weird. So I open up the box, and there it is. It was titled Panty Raid. That was the first one I saw. And see, my, my, this is my dad's uh, porn. And then, like, 
I, he never really learned that you shouldn't hide it there. And I certainly wasn't going to tell him, but it got to the point where I'd kind of forgotten about it. <laughs> and then I remember like years later, Gail was at the house because I've known her since I was 17 and she's at the house and I look down and I go, Oh my God, there's another one. It's a different one. So we pulled it out. This one was called Christmas tits. And I just, <laughs> yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. And I remember like during the, like the, the sex scene, the song was like, it's a merry, merry Xmas. My love. That was, a, <laughs> that was how the song was. <laughs> on adult, G. I can't, I can't hate on that. Hey, it kind of had a jam to it, dude. But yeah. anyway, yeah, that was my experience. That's, you know, it's, it's funny because, uh, we left out all the gross stuff. Well, no, that's, it, it's, it's a, it's funny how we all had, except we start, uh, John or Joe, you, you, you're not 40 yet. No, not yet. I'm 39. Okay. So we're, we're around, I mean, I'm way older. Don't even trip. You know what I'm saying? I was you're running in the that. streets. Jeez, like stop. three years older. That's a long time. Anyway. Um, so you're around like you were there when there, you know, we were all around the same general, you know, time frame where, you know, you didn't have ready made nasty books and, and or uh, videos online and all that stuff at your disposal. I think our brain literally is different than kids now. I think there's some things that just their their brain, the certain sections of their brains are just formed quicker because they're able to watch it so soon. We just couldn't see it that soon. We had to literally do like what Mission Impossible type stuff in order to get something, except for, you know, Dan, it was just right there. I was also a latchkey kid too. So I had a lot of time on my hands. So did I, I had to, uh, I, uh, uh, watch my sister after school every day. Oh, there's your problem. <laughs> right. I mean, seriously, that, that kind of, that kind of, I'm not saying it's a problem. Like, cause you had to watch Porsche. I'm saying like, <laughs> it's a problem because you sort of did not have the time to, uh, Could experiment. Not, I couldn't even do the, because <sighs> she was something, man. Like there was no time alone, which is makes sense because your younger person always wants to be around you and everything. She looked up to her brother. Exactly. Now I see that. Now I see that. But then I didn't. So yeah, I didn't get a chance to do all that. But if I had the internet, G, and some freaking headphones, I don't know. I'm worried about myself, bro. I think <laughs> I would have hurt myself because <laughs> my testosterone was so like... It, it was so extreme at that age, man. My testosterone was out of control. I would have, if I could see that stuff, holy cow. Oh my God, I would have acted a fool, bro. So a then stone fool. being around your parents in that environment, how did you, uh, I mean, you know, I don't want details, of course, but like, what was your, what was your Mission Impossible scheme? I, I just had to I had to hide everything. I had books on top of books on top of books, but I had such a massive room that I could be like, okay, I could put this over there, this over there. I remember one time, dude, I had I put a book in, in between my mattress. It was the most obvious thing in the world. And one day I got a – my mom said she had gone into my room to tidy up a bit or something like that. And uh, she's like, instead, I sent dad. I said, oh. <laughs> so I go up there and I lift up my mattress and my book's not there. And I I was like, Dad, gone it. And I just said, oh, well. And I picked up my mattress a little more and it was hidden deeper into the mattress. Like he was like, come on, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, good, look it out. He put it way deep. He's like, come on, man. What are you like? What are we doing right now? It's funny that your mom's like, I can't even go in there. You go in. <laughs> he's like, just take this walkie talkie. Like, walks. So he's like, all right. Uh, I'm in. <laughs> Lifting up the mattress. Oh, God. It, he does. It. Yes, he's doing it, honey. <laughs> I'm coming out. This is too gross. Here's the funny part. Dad, I got a question. This is, and I, uh, I don't know, Joe. Do you have children? Yes, I got two boys. How old are they? Uh, nine and twelve. Okay, you're getting there. Mm-hmm. Dan, what is it with that boy smell in a room? Oh, that's just. Uh, <laughs> um, that's just terrible. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you, you haven't really gotten here yet, it. Joe. That's right. That's a really good thing to bring up. You, I'm sure you're probably aware. Like, did your parents ever walk into your room and be like, "Oh, 
what is that smell? And you're like, and you're like, there's nothing. I'm just sitting here. It's you. <laughs> That's the smell. It's teenage musk. Is that yeah. what it is? Yeah. <laughs> Code name Elon. That's what it is. I never understood because even when it's clean, I walk in, I'm like, dude, what? It, what is that? <laughs> you can. It's almost palpable. <laughs> <laughs> I gave up though. I gave up. So, oh, you're on your way, Joe. Yeah, it's coming. Oh, I know. It's it just a, in some of the tussles they get in now. It's oh, like, what's dude. it going to be like when they're both teenagers? Oh my oh, gosh, dude. Have you have you had the talk with them yet? The 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 birds and the bees. Not yet. <laughs> How old? Nine and twelve. <laughs> yeah, hey, you're getting so close. Yeah, I'm that's what I'm just close. thinking. You're there, dude. It, I haven't. I never. I just told Maj. I was like, uh, when you do it, protect yourself. And then a stork fun. comes. Dude, I just said I would. I don't want kids. I don't want you to be a disease. Just, just make sure you know what you you know what's up. Steve's like, the let, me, let me sit you down, boy, and talk about the Baba Duke for a second. Listen, <laughs> that was my main worry because if he came here with like a cold sore, I'd be like, I have to take him in the side room and be like, dog, now you got to use my paper cups. I can't let you use the good good <laughs> glass. Wait, 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 what? <laughs> I think I, either you cut out and I put two things together that shouldn't be together. No, if he, I was saying if he visited and he had like a herpes blister, I'd be gotcha. like, oh, now I got to get a brand okay. new set of cups for you. I won't even tell you where my brain went. Never mind. Good. Wow. <laughs> I, That's what I thought you were saying. <laughs> okay. Wow. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> wow. You're using the good cups, boy. Fill out the Dixie cups. <laughs> wow. <laughs> then dispose of them. Don't flush. That's hilarious. <laughs> it's like a bit in how high when they don't let the RA hit the blunt. <laughs> how good was that freaking movie? I forgot all about that movie, dude, with Method Man and Red. Yes, that movie's funny as hell. <laughs> now that, okay, wait a minute. Between both of you, I'm going to ask uh, Brother Stark first. What is the best weed movie ever? Oh. Wow, that's a really good question. Um. I think in terms of quotable lines, probably half baked. Yeah. Oh, both you guys agree? I would agree, but I'm also partial to Cheech and Chong movies. But I would say as far as like something more modern, yeah, I'd have to go, even though it's not that modern anymore, I would definitely go with half baked. Just watch that actually like a week ago. It's still funny. Nice. Still hilarious. We were, but, Gail and I were sitting there just rolling. I don't I've seen that movie a hundred times. Have you seen it that many times? Well, I mean, not literally, but I've seen it a bunch of times. Gee. I watch it pretty much anytime I, like, I find it on TV, I never turn it off. Oh, for sure. Unless I have somewhere to go, I'm going right. to watch the whole, even just for like, uh, uh, F you, F you, you're cool. F you, I'm out. <laughs> that drug is so, that is the dream. And then the, uh, the, I believe him, yo. I don't know why, but I don't I know do. why, but I do. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, I think the crown still goes to Friday. Oh, dude. How could I? Okay. Let's talk about Friday for a sec. <laughs> you know what I'm oh, saying? let's do this. Cause Friday changed my life. And dude, and it seems dude. silly saying this, but so I was, you know, I grew up in, in rural Iowa, this mm-hmm. small town, mm-hmm. and I was always kind of counterculture. And so I was really into skateboarding and stuff like mm-hmm. that to where a lot of other people in the town would look at kids like me and the kids I hung out with. And, and like, they, they said we were a gang and shit like that. And it's like, you guys are so funny just because we would just, there was nothing to do in this little town. So we'd just like hang out on like a, a, a shop stoop on main street. And like when there were no cars going by, we'd skateboard or play hacky sack and shit like that. And so of course the older folks didn't trust anything we were doing. Yes. Now, you know, moving forward with this story, maybe they had some good basis here, but <laughs> so we watched the movie Friday for the first time and we're all super motivated to, to smoke weed for the first time because <laughs> that looked fucking awesome. And, <laughs> and so my Two of our friends had actually smoked with their parents. Their parents got them high when they were like 15 and 14. I could almost, visualize these, I could almost visualize these kids. I had a friend like that. And, and so we, we're like staying over at their house. And so I'm like, well, ask your parents if they'll get us all high. And so then they come back out looking real scared. And they're like, my dad actually said, if you tell anybody, he'll, he'll kill you. <laughs> right. and, I'm, and I'm like, okay, I'm not saying anything to anybody. Jesus. Wait, <laughs> and so, so then, you did it? Well, what we did was we all pooled our money together and we called a girl who was a junior in high school. So we were all freshmen and we knew this girl yeah. was a junior who smoked. And so we called her up from the one pay phone that was in town. We were <laughs> like, we scraped $25 together. Can you get us in, is it called an eighth, an eighth of, of a pot? 
<laughs> and so she's like, I don't have any to sell, but you guys can come over and, and, and I'll smoke you up. And so like all five or six of us go and we're hanging out in like the one little alley that's in this little town that I grew up in. And we're all clustered around. We all get a chance to hit it a couple times. And and yeah, it was. And then from then on out, it was because I never drank and I was never able to get drunk because I, I hated the taste of it. Yes. And so yes. the first time I ever got fucked up was from from weed. And I was like, oh, this is great. It's just giggly. It doesn't make me feel like I'm going to fucking vomit. And so in and really, I can credit that all to the movie Friday. <laughs> Dude, your life literally changed at Friday. Yeah. Watching Friday. Yeah, it was what pushed me over the edge and made me try it. And then I was like, then I started questioning everything. I'm like, well, fuck, if this isn't bad, but like all the the dare stuff says that this is terrible. It's like, if this isn't that bad, and then, you know, like I, I never got into like hard drugs or anything yeah. like that. But from marijuana, I went on to try, you know, like psychedelics, like LSD and mushrooms and stuff like that. And, and I, I feel like doing, having those experiences in my late teens and early 20s, like really, opened my eyes up to like the sort of like look at me egotistical self-centered behavior that I indulged in a lot when I was a teenager and like having those experiences in psychedelics like really pointed the camera back at myself and made me realize what sort of person I was and so so in a way Friday led to to me like really growing as a human being (laughs) you know it's that is so interesting because I listened to this. I listened to a podcast uh, from a dude that's really into psychedelics named Shea Moss, and uh, it's called Here We Are. And he always talks about how psychedelics changed his life. And everyone I've talked to or that has ever done it is like, oh, it's life changing. My only fear is puking, dude. I know I'm going to get nauseous, and I just can't stand feeling like that. The only way I'd feel like that is if someone was like, oh, by the way, it's part of the experience. Like if I did, ayahuasca they're like oh no it's part of the experience so it's kind of a given whereas mushrooms i heard it could make you sick or you could just go right into the trip i'm like oh that makes me nervous so you didn't get nauseous at all with mushrooms or uh any of the psychedelics no no and i'm right there with you with with puking dude that's that's the main reason i was never a drinker And, and even to this day i'm i'm not much of a drinker because i don't like feeling like like I, I will literally lay in bed with the spins for four hours being miserable, knowing the entire time I could just go and make myself throw up and it would Mm-mm. all go away. Yeah. Nah, no. nah, <laughs> nah, <laughs> no, <laughs> not, no, not, no. I hate my fucking hate puking. So do I. And so it never made you like, especially shrooms, since it's actually activated in your stomach, it doesn't actually make you like, Leesh. well, Oof. see almost, almost every single time I, I ever did mushrooms, I only ate half an eighth. I, we, we'd buy an eighth and then me and a friend would split it. Um, now the, the last time I did mushrooms, I, I, I took a heroic dose and, and rather than an eighth, <laughs> so, <laughs> so like an eighth would be like what, around three and a half grams or so. And so then half of that, like maybe 1.75 grams, I ate probably like 10 to 12 grams. Oh Jeez, my God, dude. Uh, I got dude. too cocky. I, I, I was crap? thinking I was, I was like, I was like, I'm, I'm doing mushrooms every weekend. I'm, I'm handling this really well. I'm going to crush this shit. And so I <laughs> ate all of those. And then in the time it took to connect my PlayStation two and fire up grand theft auto three mm-hmm. and start running around jacking cars. I look over at the heater that's, that's in the, the cabin that I'm at. And it's got all these patterns of rectangles in it and all of a sudden they're growing out of control the venetian blinds are getting wider and taller holy crap and i look at my buddy and i'm like i'm tripping balls already and he goes no way he's like you just ate him five minutes ago i'm like i might have fucked up (laughs) holy crap dude so and then tell how how does it proceed it's uh it it turned into the 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 last time i i tripped because it was a bad trip and Uh it i totally well i did the thing that you're never supposed to do where where this was like our rule that we had with our friends because every time we saw somebody do it 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 ended in a bad trip i i said the words i am just gonna go lay down for a little bit i'll be okay Ooh, and so yeah, i went bad. into the bedroom fully clothed and i came out of the bedroom out of my mind and only my underwear <laughs> with Dude. like no basis on what was real and what was just going on in my head yeah, you I didn't the, take a guide with you, man. That's the problem. Well, someone well, to guide you through it. Luckily, my buddy that I was tripping with took a lot less, and and mm. he didn't leave me. He he stayed there and put up with me. That's good, dude. It, yeah, and and then you know, three hours later, I was fine. But then the next day yeah. was 
like the real let's sit and think about everything you learned last night because for like legit like I wasn't educated enough in psychedelics to be doing them the way I was doing. I I wasn't doing them to get some sort of thing where I would expand my mind and try and become a better person. That that was all incidental. And and it was all from the self-reflection that happened after having a bad trip because you know, it, had I known more about it, like the the lethal dosage for mushrooms to actually take enough to die is is pretty substantial to the point where it's really hard to have like an accidental overdose on just mushrooms and Had I known that, I probably wouldn't have been freaked out as much, but I was convinced I was going to die. And so then I was filled with all this shame that of what, what, what am I putting my parents through? They're going to find out that their, their oldest kid died of a drug overdose. And, and so I'm just like thinking what's, what would be the last thoughts of my life is nothing but shame over, over what I've done. And so then when, when I didn't die <laughs> and then years later when I learned about it, 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 it was funny. But at the time it was that kick that I needed because up to that point I, w- I was very self-centered in, in lots of stupid look at me behavior. I had, I had an 83 Mustang hatchback that had s- loud subwoofers in the back. I'm talking like rattle, rattle windows and buildings like four blocks away. Is that a Fox body? A Fox body? The Mustang. Uh, th- this was the hatchback style that they came out with yeah. in 79. Nice. Yeah. And, and the one that I got, I mean, it was such a cool car for a, a 17 year old to get. It was an 83. No and it. so I got it in 97. So it was pretty old. Nice. It, it had a, a V6 in it that was worn down. So, I mean, like if I, if there was sand on the pavement, I could turn them over. <laughs> Look at this dude. But it had T-tops, dude. Like when would you ever see a Mustang with T-tops? So it was kind of rare in that regard. And I mean, it was super fun car, but, and so I had this flashy car that was really loud. And, and at the time that the bad trip happened, I I was dating uh, Lindsay, who I'm now married to. Wonderful woman, by the way. Oh, she's the best. And, and she was actually somebody that I thought of constantly during that bad trip. I kept telling Nick about how much I screwed up and that I wasn't treating her right because we had a very off again on again relationship that was entirely my fault you know it was just me not it it was me being a a, a more focused on me and being afraid that what if what if this girl breaks my heart and and so in turn i was being an asshole and i kept breaking her heart over and over again and then that night when i was having that bad trip it made me think about all that stuff it made me think about like like these people that, that that you know i feel like i have really good friendships with like if if I'm not going out and, and smoking pot on the weekends and just driving around on gravel roads doing fucking nothing, are are they still friends? Are they still there? Or are we just acquaintances that really we're just getting together because we're all just smoking pot and we have nowhere else to go because it's rural Iowa? And so like it just opened up like all these doorways in my mind that I'd never considered before. And so it at the time that you know the bad trip was the worst thing that happened. But now looking back on it, I credit it as one of the best things that ever happened in my life because I don't think I would have grown up to be some rural Iowa MAGA hat wearing bush light swilling fucking moron. But I I definitely don't think I would be as empathetic as I am now had something like that not happened. That's interesting because that's kind of what the only reason I want to do the ayahuasca experience is because a it's out of my comfort zone. So it's like, you have to work to get this experience. It's not like I could just, you know, smoke something and, oh, I see the gods. No, you have to actually go somewhere, find someone who's, you know, cultured in this thing, do it, suffer the consequences, and then actually, uh, you know, leave with an experience that is life-changing. Even though it's way, I, like I said, the puking and the diarrhea and all that crap, I could live without it. I yeah. could live with, but they're like, you have to do that. In order to get the experience you want, how bad do you want it? Or just go home and be comfy like you've been doing. <laughs> and sit, you know what I'm saying? Sit on your biscuit, you know, not trying to risk it. Chill. But you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so- uh, Say it again. What was it? Sit on your biscuit, not trying to risk it? Yeah. That, I, like I got it. that. Yeah, I got that from the office. He's like, you're safe on your biscuit, never trying to risk it. And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> that is like me right now watching the office. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm like, I could be practicing doing something- actually worthwhile instead of but um so you've never thought i know dan said he'd go have you ever thought of doing the ayahuasca thing Joe? 
Uh, no. And, <laughs> and mostly for the reason, for, for the reason that you have against it, the, the puking and the shit. Oh, so I hear fun. that's way worse with ayahuasca. Yeah. yeah. Oh God. And, and also part of it is the, okay, you're going to have to go to a jungle somewhere and then you're going to have to yes. trust some shaman. And yes. then also I'm, it's like, okay, how many of those people are legit? And how many of those people are just trying to take money from tourists who want to come there to a jungle and go on a vision quest. Like th- there's a certain amount of, of letting go that, that I have a real problem with. Like I'm, I'm wound way tighter than, than I need to be. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what part of it. Cause like for me, I would research and try to get the right person, but even then you're trusting the people that have been dealing with this to take care of you. And so when you're just like, I don't think I could deal with it. And they're just like, you're fine. Just calm down. You're fine. You have to trust them to be like, well, he said I'm fine, so I have to trust that I'm fine. That'll be hard for me, knowing that this is a, this is a feeling I have in my stomach that I've been trying to avoid for 20-something years now, and now it's happening, and it's going to happen. The worst is about to come, and then it goes into a – I mean, when you see videos, dude, some of these people are like barely standing and having to be taken to a river to kind of cool off, but every, all of them, after it's done, they're just like, oh, my God. Like I spoke to the universe. I'm like, I want that feeling. But, you know, that's. Oof. I really I, wish that I had that type of experience with any time that I did hallucinogenics, but it was always like I never had a life changing moment per se. Like how, you know, Joe saying that he, he was really thinking about Lindsay a lot and, and reevaluating his life. That's awesome that that happened. For me, though, I, I never really had that. It was just always the, I said the craziest shit last night or, or <laughs> we, we, you know, because. Like the, my first experience was with, with LSD and back then, like they were cutting it with speed and shit like that. And so like, I just had a very intense experience on it. I never had a bad trip, but I never gained that kind of like perspective on myself or anything like that. You know what I mean? So I, I, I'm yeah. kind of envious of that actually. Like my experience basically was we were teenagers, we're at the mall and <laughs> one of our buddy, one of our buddies had been like talking about it. He just did it with his older brother and he's like, where there was like a, you know how like there always used to be like arcades in the malls and stuff like that. So we're hanging out at this mall and um, we were like, we were talking about it, you know, just very openly. And we left. Now this is the weird part. We left the mall and we go to the bus stop cause we're getting ready to go home. And I, I was the one that said it. I go, man, I just really wish we could try that out sometime. And what happened was we later found out the guy, some, somebody in there heard us and we kind of followed us out and actually had some. So it was like what I, my perspective was like, man, I really wish we had some of that. And it was like, tap, tap, tap. Here you go. So it was really fucking <laughs> weird. We found out later he followed us, you know what I mean? But, um, cause it was just like right outside the, the mall. Yeah. So we were like, okay, uh, how much? And we, we did our deal and everything like that. And, and we went home and then we took it and I didn't realize that it takes, you know, a good amount length of time to kick into your system like sometimes like 40 it seemed like 45 minutes an yeah. hour maybe even a little bit longer that night we were going to a fresno state football game i don't recommend going to a Re- fresno state football game or your first acid experience so we got there and immediately it starts to kick in right and we're at the very top and it kicked in right around we got there late because we didn't really give a shit about it we were just going for the social part of it right around like half time because i remember sitting at the very top and the marching band comes out and they're doing all these like, you know, configurations and stuff on the field. And I'm checking out the big picture and I'm just like tapping. Oh, by the way, I'd ran into my ex-girlfriend from like the seventh grade who I really hadn't talked to since. And I was in, not in my right mind whatsoever. So I'm telling her every single thing that's going through my mind in real time. And I'm like, tap her. Hey, look at that. Hey, look at that. You see that? You see that? And just making a complete ass out of myself. <laughs> but the show was unbelievable. Like I, that's when I realized. And then that's when I discovered like trails with your hand and stuff. And so I, I I'm sure i look like that's a kid on drugs right there you know like if <laughs> in my if i was to see that kid now i would know exactly what's going on <laughs> and then what happened we uh we left the game because we got bored and we were walking around in the that's you know like tailgate section and we were just being delinquents and like my buddy knew i was always following my one buddy and uh, he's like let's get into the ice chest and find some beers or something like that which is exactly what we did then a security guard chased us off and he was chasing after us and i remember hiding underneath a, a van for like Oh, it seemed like an hour. It's probably like five minutes, but I was just hiding because I didn't want to get caught. My buddies find me. They take us over to 7-Eleven. Now I'm going to date myself right now. We're hanging out at 7-Eleven and <laughs> Chernobyl just happened. Okay. So this is a long ass time ago when I did this. 
I was running them streets. I was running them streets already, bro. What's that? I was running in the streets. Yeah, well, obviously I was too on LSD. So I'm running to the <laughs> st- so I, I'm in the 7-Eleven and Chernobyl just happened probably like a week before. And there was this time, I'll send you the picture, guys, if you want, but there's a um there's this time magazine that had one of the Chernobyl survivors like in one of their little plastic you know, you saw Sharon, but like just basically plastic drapes in the hospital and he's like sitting up and he's staring at the picture smiling. And it was the most horrific thing that I'd ever seen in my life. And I could not, whereas like I, I was horrified by it. He wasn't talking to me or anything like that. He was just looking at me. I was not only horrified, but for some reason I'm laughing hysterically at this picture in the middle of Seven Eleven. And then this bum comes in. I remember bum, homeless guy, sorry, comes in. And he was completely covered. He was talking to himself. And I really hadn't seen many homeless people at that time. You know, I just wasn't, it wasn't on my radar. But this dude had like peanut butter and jelly all up in his beard. And he was just like mumbling, mumbling to himself. So I'm dying. I'm on the fucking floor, <laughs> dying laughing, like making a complete fucking scene. Luckily, my friend who had some experience knew, like, it's time to get this guy out of here because I probably would have gotten arrested or something like that. We ended up going back to his house for a little bit, which was insane because his parents were home. And, uh, I'm sitting in the room. He's like, I got to go and take care of something real quick. So this guy was crazy enough to go and talk to his parents while he's on LSD. <laughs> and I'm sitting, yeah, I know. And I'm sitting in his room, right? And he had nothing but Metallica and Slayer and Anthrax pictures from like Hit Parade Magazine and Kerrang and stuff all just, you know, taped to his wall. And I'm sitting there and I'm staring at a picture of Metallica. And it's like James Hetfield's like looking at me, right? And he had this kind of look on his face like, what the fuck are you looking at? And I was just, I wasn't like thinking he was talking to me. And I wasn't thinking he was sending me like psychic, you know, like t- ESP kind of shit. I was just like, I just started. That's probably the moment like I had w- where Joe had where I'm like, what am I looking at? And I started kind of going off almost on a bad trip. Like, what am I? Wh- why am I staring at him like that? Anyway, it- it's hard to explain these things when you're on acid, of course. You know what I mean? Because it, it, <laughs> it just sounds ridiculous. But I spent a lot of that. <laughs> I spent a lot of time in that room getting shamed by Metallica. And then after that, I don't really remember much of the night outside of just roaming the streets, laughing our asses off and, and probably just doing shit that we shouldn't have been able, you know, like probably vandalized or something like that. There was no, <laughs> there was no vision quest is what I'm getting at. So that long story really just equates to me just being a delinquent. I really wish I would have had that. Even when I took shrooms, I didn't have that. It was just this, everything was just so much more vibrant. You know what I mean? Yeah. Fireworks. We was at 4th of July the first time I tried that. So the fireworks were really awesome, but I'm kind of oh, jealous. Be amazing. It was really, really <laughs> cool. There's this place called Bass Lake where we live. It's, uh, if you're heading up towards like Yosemite area. They have this massive fireworks show on the lake. So we would, we went camping and then we just would go down. You know, if we were way up high, we'd go down and just find our own little cove and sit there and watch it. It was incredible, dude. So much fun. But yeah, I never got that whole vision quest thing. I'm a little jealous right now, now that I'm talking about it. <laughs> Dude, you speaking of like a, a a vision quest, like uh, I never had anything in, in terms of visuals like crazy happen during the times I did psychedelics. It was more just like you know trails and and things like that. I never saw anything like you know like a a, a lawn gnome come to life and start chasing me or any, yeah. anything weird. Yeah, like neither that. But um, a, a friend of mine and some of his friends had read about Jimson weed. Have you ever heard of Jimson weed? I have, yeah. but I don't know what what is that. It's it's like a a weed plant that kind of grows everywhere. It's indigenous to North America and it's got these purple flowers on it and they were reading about him and he lived out in the country and so they went out into a field next to his house and found some and cracked the seed pods open and they each had like a small handful of seeds and like they all ate them. Two of them chewed up the seeds before swallowing them and the other two just swallowed the seeds. Oh. Now the two that chewed up the seeds woke up the next they went to bed thinking oh that didn't work nothing happened and the two that chewed up the seeds woke up in an alternate reality the next morning that only they could see (laughs) holy crap and like this happened on a sunday and so this is all coming from my buddy who who it happened to and he said he woke up the next day and he thought it was still sunday and he thought his friends were still over and so he's just hanging out on his front porch having full conversations with his friends when his mom gets a call at work from the school saying that he's missed, he's not in class. And so she goes home to check on him and finds him on the front porch, having full conversations with people who aren't there. And he said, he just remembered like being so mad at his friends for not saying something. Cause he kept saying like, he, he's <laughs> like, I didn't understand why my mom was yelling at me. I kept saying it's Sunday. Tell her guys, tell her. Oh. 
And he's like, and my friends just stood there staring at their feet and they wouldn't say anything. And I was so mad. And so then they're like, okay, you're fucked up. You're on something. They took him to the hospital and put him in a straight jacket and a padded room. And then three days later, he remembered he ate Jimson weed. Jeez, they 51 50 him, huh? They did. He said it was terrible. (laughs) He's like, don't Mm. ever eat that. He's like, it's a funny story, but don't ever eat that. And I'm like, yeah, fucking no shit. There's the take home right there, kids. Do not eat Jimson weed. Do Stick with shrooms. Eat. It's better for you. <laughs> Jimson weed. Don't do drugs. But if you're going to do it, wash it down with a nice IPA, you know? <laughs> do it right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> do a ginger beer for Steve. Oh, dude, listen. I'm still addicted to that stuff. That stuff is fan freaking fantastic, man. That is fan. Although, like I said, I got into um, bourbon. Fancy pants, man. I'm trying. Well, the thing is, man, I need to be able to go to a play. Uh, like, instead of doing the whole, uh, you know, hey, can I have a chocolate martini? That sounds ridiculous. So now it could be a bourbon on the rocks. Bourbon on the rocks. That's such an old man's drink. Hey, I'm, I'm 42, Jay. I don't know if you got the memo. Okay. <laughs> All right, youngster. That's <laughs> that is, that's Tell a sophisticated thing. drink. Yes. And it's one of those things also, like, a, a few of my friends, and I'm not going to, I will not start because I know where it takes me. But a few of my friends are really into smoking cigars. I mean, like really into smoking cigars. It's like a thing. And uh, and I'm just like, I don't understand. I'm like, aren't you afraid of cancer? No. I'm like, why? Oh, because, you know, studies show that it really doesn't. There are no studies that show that. I was like, that's not true. You're going to get cancer if you smoke cigars. No. And dude, they try every, I mean, every weekend they say, hey, you want to come out and smoke cigars? I'm like, no never going to do it. That's just one of those things I'm just not even interested in doing. But L- but LSD and all that stuff. I want to be able to go to my grave saying I did it all. Not all. But I'm like <laughs> I've, I've done the psychedelics. I've done the psychedelics. I've gotten what I needed from them. I've met with the gods. We've talked and everything is copacetic. Can I join you on this quest? Sure, dude. Listen. First quest is ayahuasca. Are we incriminating ourselves talking about this on this podcast? Hypothetically, Steve, can I join you on this quest? <laughs> For sure, dude. I wouldn't, though, because that's terrible. <laughs> ayahuasca? That's illegal. Oh. oh, I don't see. I don't know if ayahuasca is. Uh, you know, I don't think it is because, well, first of all, we're not in America doing it. You can. Just, there are actual like uh, places now here. Uh, like I don't want to have it given to me by some cat named Brad, though. That's who it is. It's like a bunch of the Hollywood stars. <laughs> yeah. Go to this guy Fucking Jared like, Leto's going to come walking out. Bingo. In his That's what it is. Right. <laughs> and a lot of them are like, it was, f- I do it weekly. And I'm like, they're not crapping and puking. Oh, they're giving them some sort of fake. This is definitely not the experience you're going to get in the, in the, in some village, you know, where they have, freaking fire ants and gloves you're not going to get it you're not going to get the same thing here <laughs> psilocybin's legal in colorado so i mean you could i i would with psychedelics i would recommend crawling before sprinting <laughs> yeah don't go straight is to the ayahuasca, ayahuasca is ayahuasca sprint i would say that i is would a say full that. On sprint. Okay, i didn't know that i didn't know what's well, the what's the crawl okay well see the difference is, is when you do ayahuasca the the active ingredient in it is dmt and DMT is like just super intense. I, I I've never done a psychedelic that's that's DMT. Like I, I've done LSD and and psilocybin mushrooms, and then one time I did God, what the hell was it? I don't even uh, mescaline. I I tried that Ooh. once, and that was about the weakest of all. Oh, really? I thought I that was I thought that was stronger. Actually, I don't know. I I did a. A, like a single blotter hit of it and it was it was fun i did a lot of giggling and stuff but it wasn't like doing like a a gel tab of, of lsd or something like that that was like a gel tab of lsd was, in terms of single hits was probably about the most intense thing i ever did but but from what i've heard about from other people who, who take dmt is that it's like a very fractal or fractal experience where like you'll close your eyes and it's almost like looking through a kaleidoscope Oh, dude. Type shit where it's that seems like pretty mind bending. Whereas with psilocybin, like you can take like a small dose and and really you should look up um, like microdosing psilocybin, too, because that's got some really interesting research behind it. But yeah, I was just going to talk about that. Yeah, they're but, actually uh, they're actually starting to talk about opening that up in Oakland, California. They should. Where, yeah. Where they're, they're using sense. it for like um, treatment of uh alcoholism or yeah, just anxiety. I heard it works. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it, that's something that they're actually flirting with. I, I'm pretty sure they passed some kind of city, city thing on it, but I don't think it's like fully gone where shops are open and whatnot. But yeah, it's. I think we're on the verge of that, actually. 
Well, I mean, in my opinion, all drugs should be legal. You already know that. You already know that that's my my thing. But I, in my, I like for me, I think um, I've re- I've I've done a little research on on mushrooms, and the best I've got when I say research, research, I'm saying like talking to friends who have done it, and they're like, <laughs> I think the better idea for you would be putting it in a tea. I was like, how does that make me not puke? They're like, we don't think you'll puke anyway. But if you feel more comfortable, put it in a tea, and you'll it'll go down smoother. Instead of eating it, I was like, I didn't even know they had mushroom tea. Did not know that. I'm like, yeah, you put it in a tea, you'll be fine. I put an eighth of it on pizza one time. <laughs> How did that, that work for you? Because they're so nasty, they taste terrible, and I'm the guy that's going to puke every single time. Like, I can't <laughs> oh, start yeah. the party until I puke. Well, then again, I don't know. I think between the two of us, if we both do all these things, we'll be two I puking would... motherfuckers. Is what we're no. Gonna do. <laughs> I would puke way more than you because my stomach is it just. Like once I start, if my balance is off, it's over. But remember who you're talking to, Steve. Yeah, your stomach is sensitive, dude. Yeah, I got GI issues, so I, I don't know, yeah. man. <laughs> I don't know. We used to always eat them with Wendy's French fries. Ooh, and then they're it was not the pretty best good. French fries. Are, would you say Wendy's or McDonald's? Uh, I think McDonald's French fries are way better. But for Here's some reason, whenever we would eat mushrooms, we would eat them with Wendy's fries. That makes total sense. It, it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. Here's the thing. In and out, they should just call their fries potatoes because they're literally just potatoes. They don't even it just be like, if I wanted to taste a potato, I would just cut up a potato and eat it. I want my fries to not resemble potatoes. Like Wendy's, I would not be able to tell that these things came from potato. Neither would I, I wouldn't be able to tell that from McDonald's either. In and out fries, I'm just like, these things are freaking disgusting, dude. They're just gross, man. Joe, do you have an in and out? Where are you from? We don't have in and out here. And th- so th- that's like a California thing, right? Yes. You're yeah. Not yeah. I just thought yeah. maybe it had worked its way that way. You know what I think? Surprisingly mediocre. The whole, the whole establishment. I think the, 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 I think the, um, or the, the, the ambiance is what it is, what makes in and out the spot because they're like, people talk about us. It's just like, we have this place called Dutch brothers here. Ugh. It's not good coffee. It's trash. It's just <laughs> soccer moms talk about it so much that they fool each other into going. That brothers what is it trash. Is. I hope you hear it too. Some employee just listening. Although you, <laughs> you know work what? for a trash establishment. <laughs> they did say Black Lives Matter, so I kind of have to. I have to. Pay oh, all right, I take it back. I, but I you know, know really I know. Back taking... <laughs> on you, freaking Dutch bros, <laughs> being nice uh, and shit. <laughs> tell me about it. But um, I do. If, if I'm going to do this in the next five years, I'm going to actually like. I'm going to have taken all three. Okay, maybe not ayahuasca because I, it's just you really have to take a plane, go somewhere, and I would rather have my first vacation away be something fun than to be like, well, shoot, I guess the only reason I came here was for that. No, I want to have had a good vacation. Then I'll be like, okay, now I could go into the forest just to take this plant that I'm trusting this shaman to pray over me and so that I can um, sit around the table and have tea with. Thor and Zeus. <laughs> I really agree with Joe, though, Steve. I think that you should probably microdose. I think probably shrooms would be your best bet because you can just take a little bit at a time, kind of ride it out and see where you're going, as opposed to just taking like this little square with Bart Simpson on it and popping it into your, <laughs> under your tongue. You know, what <laughs> just, you know, rolling the dice, see what happens. I think it'd be way and, more. And, and also, like mushrooms is is, is a good one if if you want to try a psychedelic mushroom, it would be a good entry point because it doesn't last very long. It's like two to three hours. Whereas yeah. if you take a hit of acid, twelve hours, baby, buckle up. Yeah, I mean, you, even when you think it's gone and you're like, oh, I'm going to lay down and go to sleep now, you're going to close your eyes and all. It's going to look like. Like an old Windows 95 computer when they had the one screensaver on where it looked like you were going through a colorful tunnel. You ain't even that, that's what it would be mind. like. And there is no sleep. It's just. I do, I do not want to wake up in some colorful uh, bedroom like <laughs> where Sergeant Pepper is alone. I'm like, what the <laughs> crap is happening right now? Steve, like, sitting on a cornflake. <laughs> <laughs> when you was I'm like, okay, this is not over. This is, not, but I, I think I will enjoy it. It's right up because the people that I love so much, other than Joe Rogan, are big psychedelic people. The people that I love listening to, I'm just like, why are these people so deep? Or they understand their dumbness. They're like, look, I'm asking you because I just don't know. What is that? I'm like, these are the people I need to be hanging around where they're like, I talk to the smartest people and ask the dumbest questions that all of us want to know. And the smartest people answer. I'm like, these are psychedelic people that are just like, oh, I am totally aware of how dumb I am and how small I am in the universe. 
I think psychedelics have helped that. As far as from what I've read. And I understand how small I am in the universe, but I want to I want it to be reinforced so that when I'm worried about some random bull crap, I'm like, wait, let me take this all, let me take everything into consideration. I am the, a freaking microscopic dot on this microscopic dot on this vast universe. And I'm worried about a tiny thing like this. Just breathe. And I think the psychedelics will help that. Wow. It definitely could, man. I mean, it's, it is one of those things that a lot of people say is akin to like a, a religious experience and they can get that from, from something that's as, as fairly benign as, as psilocybin. And, you know, I mean, granted, I'm not a, a scientist or anything, but w- when I had Kevin Shanks on Startcast for the first time, I asked him a bunch of questions about it. And so I, I know he, he would be the person to ask way more like poignant questions <laughs> in terms of, you know, the toxicology aspects and stuff of it. But just in terms of the experience, I, I think that that's where you would want to go for a first one. And the fact that it's legal, you know, in Colorado is, is a plus. Dude, I wonder how hard it would, it would be to get a bonus app with me, Dan, Stark, Shanks. Uh, probably super easy. <laughs> <laughs> should I just fucking call him fun? real quick? You should <laughs> not make that fun at all, Dan. You should have been like, Hmm. I know Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> no Joe. I don't Kevin's think it'd be a great. problem. Yeah. <laughs> that would be such a fun bonus episode where we're just asking questions. And if anybody wants to know music, I could help you, but I don't know Scylla. Here's the thing with microdosing. I would have to, I'm going to buy like a, Dan would come over and see me with a lab coat and a microscope being like, I am slicing the thinnest. You would be doing possible. the most, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I am slicing a microscopic layer. You're off trying of to shave mushroom. that shit like they did in Goodfellas <laughs> with the garlic. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you shave it with a razor blade, and it just disappears into the it olive oil. Melts in your mouth. <laughs> now, uh, uh, Stark, is there a is there a like if I take too small uh, a slice, will it be like nothing? Is just because of your weight, you're not going to feel anything, or is it like no matter how much you take, you're going to feel something? There's definitely a, probably a threshold and yeah, and it, it's probably influenced by, by, you know, how big you are. And, um, but, but, but then again, maybe not, you know, because I mean, I'm, I'm like 300 pounds and I never drink at all. And I can get a good buzz. If I drink one beer really fast, I can get giggly. So <laughs> you don't strike me as weighing 300 pounds, Joe. I, I, people never say that. In, I stood in, right next to you. I never would have guessed. That. I mean, it's not a bad thing or anything, but like, I'm surprised because you just oh. don't look like it. Dude, and I was literally just looking at pictures from C2E2 last night, and I was like, wow, I'm so much fatter in those pictures. So it actually made me feel pretty good about <laughs> where I'm at right now. <laughs> See, I'm the opposite. But like at the risk of sounding like Cartman, like I have big bones. <laughs> so it, I <laughs> guess it makes me happy. <laughs> You're just pleasantly plump, huh? Well, so, and, and, you could, and so, yeah, I think I'm going to have to gauge all this then. I have to study up and have Dan over and be like, okay, I'm about to do something really, because you, Dan, apparently, so if I'm tripping, Dan can't. What do you mean? Oh, because no. Because you have to kind of lead me through it. No, I think that we should just take the journey together, go on a bogus journey. Oh, dude, yes. no, 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 gee. Yes. Because what no. if I trip? No, 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 there's nothing worse than like babysitting a tripping person if you're yeah. not tripping. I, I'm being I've a bit been selfish there right now. It's <laughs> Yeah, I'm totally being selfish, but I don't want to deal with your shit. I'd rather, I would rather, I would rather be in the like try to find our way out together versus like trying to guide you out, doing the come into the light. You know, I don't want to do that shit to you. All are welcome. No, but for real, if you were to just eat like say half an eighth, and all, and then hang out with somebody that you're really good friends with, like like if you and Dan each like split an eighth and hung out together, you would laugh so hard your cheeks would hurt. Like you'd be like, my face hurts. I can't stop smiling yeah, and laughing. And it would be like that for two hours. Oh, that's that's dumb. usually what mushrooms <sighs> is, unless you're dumb and you eat fucking ten plus grams like I did. But you know, then it tends to open up shit in your mind. Apparently, <laughs> you want to talk about a bonus show, Steve? How about I come over to your house? Oh, Jesus. And we do exactly what Joe just said, and then we turn on the mics. That would be dope until I start puking. Well, no, we'll wait until all that's done. Okay. All right, cool. When you're like, well, okay, I'm the, cool, then that's when we turn them on. I would say we podcast through the ayahuasca, too, one day. <laughs> Excuse me. We're going to hit pause real quick. I got to go shit myself. I'll be right back. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you're just podcasting on a bucket. Welcome to Seriously. episode. <laughs> oh, that's Excuse right. me. Sorry. I have, to, I have to sit on other people's buckets. <laughs> Oh, I, you, I'm geez, sure dude. they at least give you your own bucket. Actually, I'm not no, sure. Dude, they no. probably just rinse it out real quick. But th- I think that'll be the last of, I wouldn't even be tripping on that though. Who's got that like, job, by the way? 
who's that guy <laughs> on, their, on their team in charge of the shit bucket? And, you know, it didn't seem I, I, I've seen about three different people take it on TV. One of them was Chelsea Handler. Uh, one of them was some random person from National Geographic. That was probably the most like, oh, this looks freaking horrifying. But after it was done, you know, uh, the whole crew was like, oh, yeah. But the thing is, it was there was a lady and like three dudes. And dude, she none of them tripped on dropping trousers and crapping in a bucket. They didn't say, oh, look at they weren't even tripping. on." I was like, wow, you have to be in another level to not worry about crapping next to someone. Have you ever been in a bad situation? No, or not it's like coming. that. Dude. Not <laughs> yeah, like that. You're not going to give a shit. Oh, you're going to give plenty, actually. But like you're <laughs> you're. Some, what am I trying to say? Your inhibitions leave you when it's down, you know, when you have to do it, when it's coming and you can't stop it. Yeah. You don't give a shit. I would love, I would love to actually read up the, read up on the science of, oh, maybe we could talk to Shanks when he gets on with Stark uh, about why it has to flush you out for it to actually work. What do you mean? Like, why does ayahuasca have to flush you out for it to actually? Oh, and that? you mean you're talking about all of the uh, shitting and puking? Yeah, I'm like, why doesn't it just go into effect instead of being like, no, it has, it does this thing. I want, I'd love to talk to Shanks and be like, so why? why I would like to take started? an uneducated guess as to why that happens. Oh, please. Well, yeah, it's not uneducated. You are very educated in the medical field. So go on. Eh, certain parts of it. But I, what I'm trying to say is I think it's just a matter. If that's what you're going with, if that's the scenario that you have to flush yourself out in order for it to take place, which I don't entirely think is true, but let's just go with it. I think it's a matter of dehydration. You're, de- oh, you're depleting your body of, of, you know, essentials that you need and filling it with that. And I, I think that's, that. that's probably what it is, you know? Think about it. Like, if you don't eat, you ever get... To, I know you're one of those guys that's weird and you won't eat. I've seen you do it, like, for an entire weekend. But at some point, like me, I'll get a little shaky. I'll feel like I need fuel. So I'm thinking that at that particular moment is when you're at your most susceptible to it. And that's what kicks that it in. That is so... So if they actually... If the food was in water and all that stuff was still in your body... It might not even affect you at all. No, I doubt that completely. But I just think that if you're going with what you are saying, the theory that you have to flush yourself out for it to really take place, that would probably be why. That's interesting. I think actually that I'm almost 100% sure you're at I'm, least I'm not, close. but you know. <laughs> I understand, well, but it just makes sense. Here's start. what I think. I, I think that it's the delivery method that makes people sick because they're basically making like a a, a concoction because almost all plants have DMT in it, but there's a chemicals in your stomach that uh, inhibit it so that you don't have a psychedelic reaction from eating Did things like that. that. And so when they make ayahuasca, and this is where it's really trippy, is that indigenous shamans figured out that if they take this one specific root and this one specific vine or, you know, whatever it is and combine them together, one of them is rich in DMT and the other is rich in a chemical that shuts off those um, things in your stomach that inhibit the DMT. So when you take those two things together, it allows your body to process the DMT and you have a trip. But I think when you take this thing into your body, your body's like, what the fuck is this? And so it goes into emergency mode to try and get it and flush it out of your body as soon as possible, which is going to be puking and shitting. That is that a, sounds even more I reasonable. Th- that seems even more reasonable. That's all. So it literally, whatever. Told you Joe was a good make, guest. Dude, listen, <laughs> listen. We should have had him on on a day I had eight hours, dude. This is a, I would have been like, okay, what about this? <laughs> so that's interesting. I didn't know that your body naturally, like, if so, if I randomly in the woods years ago, millennia ago, ate this DMT, this plant with DMT, my body would just reject it. You would just puke and be like, oh, we don't want to have that sort of situation. Gone. It's finished. They figured out a way to be like, yeah, you may puke. But it still is going to be uh, it's still going to be received into your system. Exactly. Um, Holy it, cow! Dude. Going, going back, kind of riding on what you just did. Have you ever heard of the stoned ape theory? I have not heard of. Stoned oh, ape. this this is some really. Oh, interesting I can't wait! Shit. I can't wait, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so there's this theory that that you know during the the chain of evolution and when our ancestors way back when were in the Rift Valley in Ethiopia that we more or less just lived in grasslands and were on trees. And then we started getting lots of rain. And so that started to change the, the environment. And so there was cattle and stuff in these fields and the rain caused mushrooms to grow on these cow pies like they do present day. And early hunter gatherers started eating them. 
And some of the side effects of uh, psilocybin are uh, increased visual acuity. And it also tends to like, uh, I think it helps with fertility a little bit, like whether it just helps people get down more. I don't, I don't know what it was. Uh, almost any time I personally took mushrooms, it, that was the last thing on my mind. But, <laughs> but um, that's part of the theory is that it, there was enough benefits for it that the early man started eating these mushrooms that they were finding and it actually changed the course of human evolution and it allowed the brains to grow bigger and people to process things differently. And so there's the stoned ape theory is that mushrooms helped in the evolution of human beings. I, that sounds so reasonable to me. Yeah, totally. Right. That sounds, to- <laughs> that sounds so reasonable to me. And uh, what baffles me is not only that, that, you know, when you were talking about making this concoction, like, how many bad batches did they make and be like, well, that didn't work. Well, that didn't work. And finally they came up with the right mix. That is crazy. It had to have evolved. Yeah. Literally you just had to have evolved and to be like, you know, either one person took it and somehow their body didn't reject it all outright. And they're like, Oh my God, this is the most amazing experience. If we could figure out a way. To make these do, th- I mean, that's I don't even know where to start. When yeah, you don't where, have where the do internet, you start how, that? Right? Yeah, where do you start, G? <laughs> like, how did you know that? I want to know where. Like, who was the first person to even the light bulb went off and was like, you know, we right. could try this. They said the plants told them. Dude, that's amazing. Hey, it's yeah. awesome. Did they say it's that before so or cool. after? Oh, it's over. <laughs> it's over. That's the most amazing thing I've ever heard in the world. Exactly. Right? It's like, oh, if the, they, the plants told the me. The plants told me. And I'm like, we're, and I would be like, and I wasn't high. It just, it spoke to me. I'd be like, oh, it's over, man. This, this world, I need to live where you live because I'm not in, I would not be bombarded by the internet, TV, you know, advertisements, life in general. I just think it's just a different experience. When you could just say, oh, the plant told me and with a straight face, I'm like, I, I want to be where you're at. Yeah, there's where a part just- of me that wish I lived in a world. Because at this point, like I, the last time I did like a, a real psychedelic was when I had that bad, bad trip. And that was April 27th, 2002. Yeah, you don't forget that shit. Nope. That was the night. That was the I thought that that date was going to be chiseled on a tombstone. So I've never forgotten. Wow. That you thought you were going to you thought you were going to die. Dude, I, I thought I was going to die. When I Holy had that bad trip, I, I legit did. I, I asked God for forgiveness because that was back when I was religious. And so I asked God for forgiveness over and over and over again. I was, it, <laughs> oh but anyway, my it's so 2002. So it's been, you know, 18 plus years since, since I've done something like that. But, but dude, when I heard that it was legalized in Colorado, that was the first thought popped in my head was, well, you should probably. It's only 15 hours away. You should probably take a drive to Colorado. No, we'll jump back on the saddle. <laughs> I mean, shit, Mike Tyson's fighting again. Any all bets are off, right? <laughs> Gee, listen. And here's, here's the thing, man. I uh, I think maybe it's the, the quarantine, but randomly a person was like, hey, we're doing a uh, seven-mile hike when we're done with the quarantine. And he, and he, he's been literally this, it's a uh, hearing doctor and he's been asking me all the time and he just never stopped. And one day I just said, yeah, yeah, I'll do it. He's like, will you? I'm like, yeah, why not? Because I just don't do it. You know, I don't do now. I've been forced to go on bike, long bike rides and jogs. And I'm just like, oh, I've been missing out. I've been missing out in life in general because I've just been so comfy. Life has just been passing by. It's just like, you know, I, I just, I need to get out and do stuff that it may suck. At least when I come back on the hike, I can tell my boy, be like, I'm never doing that again. Glad I did it. Now I know I'm never doing it. Good to know. <laughs> but right now I'm just imagining I'd hate it instead of going. And then when I get back to the car, I'll be like, hey, man, we could be cool, but I'm never doing this again. It sucked. <laughs> but thank you for inviting me. <laughs> instead of automatically outright saying, nah, I know there was a thing Dan actually asked me to do and I did it. And I was like, I'm glad I did it. And What's I forgot that? what it was, dude, because it was something you asked me to do. And I'm like, you know, I didn't want to do it. And I ended up doing it. I was like, that was fun. And it wasn't like an outing or anything. I forgot what the heck it was. Trying, was like, it, I need- trying it out with the left hand? Oh, <laughs> it's called Stranger in the Tub. Hey, she, are you? She, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know what? I got to be honest with you. You caught me. Uh, I just got a notice right now. Looks like uh, The Boys Season 2 is coming out in September, guys. In case you're oh, wondering. Oh, yes. 
I think it's September oh, 8th. Yes, dude. I cannot freaking wait. I'm sorry. So I know hot. I totally like steered us off in a different direction, but I just saw that it's distracting me because I got excited. No, I'm <laughs> very excited. I think it's going to be uh, one, uh, one last random question for Stark. Yeah. What, le- what, what brought you out of the church? I, was, I knew you were going to ask that question. <laughs> oh, okay. No, but this. Okay. So I was never baptized when I was a kid. Uh-huh. I went to a Methodist Sunday school and never really got to the point where I was going to like regular Sunday services or anything. Um, my parents didn't regularly go to church or anything like that. So, you know, it wasn't their biggest priority to, to send me to services on Sunday mornings and stuff. I, I did it when I was uh, enough when I was a kid that I was familiar with, you know, the teachings of, of Christ and all that stuff. Um, now, fast forward into the future when, when my wife and I are married <clears throat> she was raised Catholic. And so when we got married, we just did it in a non-denominational church because she didn't want me to have to go through the whole, you know, RCIA, you know, convert over to Catholicism thing so we could get married in the Catholic church. You lucky um, dog. Well, <laughs> it, it just happened later because then when, when she was pregnant with, with Aiden, with our first kid, um, you know, we started thinking about it more and she was like, well, you know, we're going to have him baptized and I want him to do communion and stuff. And, and, you know, it, it'd be less questions for him if we don't have to explain why daddy doesn't go and take sacrament as well. So I was like, yeah, it's no problem. I'll, I'll go ahead and go through it. And so this was just after Easter. And so we got in touch with our local Catholic church and they said, well, we do baptisms on the Easter vigil and, you know, Easter was just last week. So, you know, strap in, come to service every, come to mass every Sunday and you can do the RCA class when, when everybody else is, is taking sacrament and then come Easter vigil, you can be baptized and officially part of the church. And so I did that for, for a year I did Catholic masses. And so the way that our church was set up, they would go through, I think the entirety of the new Testament within a year, they would cover pretty much everything. And and I did it and and I enjoyed it. It was it was weird going and sitting in the church basement and and talking with complete strangers about faith because it was one of those things where it was I I, I don't need faith to make me a good person. Like I I I'm a good person because the the thought of like not treating or the thought of treating somebody else how I don't want to be treated. Like I, I, I would just have a hard time doing that. I don't even like being purposely mean to people because like, I'll still feel bad about it. Like three months later, I'll be like, Oh fuck. Why did you do that? Yes. You came off like, like what, a, that was such a failure on your part, but, but none of that came from religion. And so when I'm hearing these people talk and then a lot of them are talking about how a lot of their morality centers around Christ's teachings and stuff on. So I, that never really clicked with me. And so I spent a lot more time listening than speaking in, in those classes. And, um, eventually got to the point where I was able to do the baptism and, and that was fun. And in the, the community around the church and stuff was, it was really great. I I never ran into a single person at church. Like a lot of people say they don't like church because it seems like a fashion show and people are getting judged on what they're wearing and stuff. And I never got that vibe from our parish. Everybody there was, was wonderful. It was great. But, um, when Lindsay was further along so I must have started this before she was actually pregnant because it was when she was pregnant that we stopped going to church because she had terrible morning sickness with Aiden. And she was worried that we'd get stuck in a pew behind somebody wearing a lot of cologne or perfume or something and, and she'd yak right in the aisle. <laughs> and so we, we just stopped going to church. And then once it wasn't a habit anymore, then it we just weren't doing it. And before he knew it, it was a month before we'd been to church. And then it was two months and then three months. And so now I'm, you know, having conversations with people and it's, I'm like, cause while I was going to church, like I was trying to argue the church's point of view on, on certain topics to, even though I didn't fully believe in it, you know what I mean? Like I could never accept the fact that the Catholic church wouldn't, wouldn't recognize gay marriage because I grew up with gay people in my family and I didn't ever since I was a kid, that was, it wasn't weird to me. That that my mom's cousin Patty was married to Michelle, and they were both women. That was just normal. Just normal. Yeah, it was. It was normal. It had been like that since as, as far back as I could remember. And and I knew I had gay cousins that were on the Stark side of the family that lived in in California. And so it was. It was never anything weird to me. And it, it got to a point where it was just 
untenable to to try and square a faith away with something where it had rules that I felt were contrary to the teachings of Christ. Because if if you just look at, in my opinion, if you just look at the teachings of Christ, it boils down to, you know, love your neighbor as you love yourself and everything outside of that. It's, it's like people cherry picking things from the old Testament so that they can try and yes. reinforce their bigotry. And, and I didn't yeah. like that, even though I didn't necessarily see it in my, in my parish, it was evident in, in other Christian organizations all around the country and all around the world that it's just a thinly veiled excuse for bigotry. And, and I just couldn't accept it. And so then the further I went down that rabbit hole, you know, I, I eventually got to the point where, <laughs> where it's like, Oh God, the, the asshole that gives fucking babies cancer. Fuck him. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. even though, you know, it's, I, I, I say shit like that because I have a dark sense of humor, but I also know it's like, there's other people that are super religious. They're like, oh, I can't believe you just said that. And it's like, well, that's my point of view. And I, I'm not trying to, to bring anybody down that, that is religious, but there's a, I, I, I just don't know how you can square the, the two sides of it. Maybe I've just gotten to a point where I'm, I'm too black and white with it, you know, where it's, I, I, I don't see how you can say that, you know, Christianity is a religion for God when, when Jesus said it's all about love. So I, I don't yeah. know. It's, it's a, it's an interesting conversation because the more, uh, like the more I read on history and, in you know, evolution and, and, you know, where we all began, you know, uh, you look at these gods that are in Africa and these gods with like the dog heads and stuff. I'm like, I get why they, why they, they serve them because that's a scary looking God. That God is like, oh, this thing could do anything. This random dog headed thing that's on this, this seat, I believe it can do, or when they worship the sun, why? Because they saw the sun and they saw what the sun did. Oh, it makes things grow. Oh, it nourishes life. Oh, that must be a deity. I get that as evol evolution goes. And I just think as, as it went and all, as it kept moving forward, you know, if I were to, if I were to want to control, say, women, the best thing I could do is write a book that says, God told me that you're underneath me. It's not me. It's this book. It's not me saying it. It's God. You're a second-class citizen, and you have to listen to me. And if people just kind of stood back and be like, wait a minute, that would be what I did if I wanted to control women, or if I wanted to grow, control people's bodies, or if I wanted to be the majority that always had the rule over the minority. I would just make it so that, A, you like a woman, men like women, women like men. And if you do it in any other way, you wouldn't want to go to hell. What's hell? It's fire forever. Well, that doesn't make any sense. I thought God was in vengeance. Okay. Well, I'm just saying you deserve it though. Burning forever. When, if people just stick away, it's like stood away. It was like, wait, 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 wait. Reset. And let's talk about what, what's really going on. I think, I think a lot of people would be like, um, like the, I think the Unitarian church is like this, where they just get together and kind of congregate because congregation is important. A lot of people that leave the church end up being like, I do miss being around people that were nice, kind, and, you know, just all around believe in something higher than, you know, we are. But once you put religion or once you put a name on it or put a, you know, a rule book on it, I think slowly we're just evolving out of it. I really do. I think it's just evolving out of it. More and more young people are just saying, yeah, I'm not buying it. I agree, man. That's that's kind of where we're at. I mean, Gail was talking about going to a Unitarian church because just for the, like you're saying, for the sake of congregation, she's pretty much with me. We, like we were talking about it the other day, I would consider myself either an atheist or, an, or a strong agnostic, you know, and I know she's on that same path. And that's the thing that gets me personally with religion. And I'm not trying to insult anyone and please correct me if I'm wrong. But I mean, I, I feel I'm right because it's just my opinion, you know, and, and what I'm saying is like you're talking about how someone theoretically wrote a book to sort of shape things the way they want them to go. That's fine. But this was over, what, 2000 years ago, something like that. So the fact that there are still institutions that believe everything that they believed that long ago without ever growing or, or using science to, to disprove some of these things or, you know what I mean? Just, just trying to update the book, if you will. I, I just, that's the, what I can't get behind personally because it yeah, just seems so, it seems so um, 
unobtainable at this point. Like it just with everything, maybe I'm just jaded, but with everything that I see in the world, it just doesn't really seem to match up to me. So well, that's, I, that's kind of my philosophy with it. That's why I'm not a religious person. Ricky Gervais said a really interesting thing that actually, and you remember, I'm not a massive Ricky Gervais fan except for the office and, you know, uh, you know, extra stuff like that. And so uh, he gets a little annoying sometimes. And uh, one day he was on Stephen Colbert's show. And Colbert is a hardline Christian, right? And they're going back and forth. And at the end, um, Ricky Gervais said, okay, let me, tell you, let me tell you why your religion is so silly. He said, if the world restarted, science, book w- science books would end up being exactly the same. Your book wouldn't. And Steven Colbert just looked at him, smiled, and shook his hand. It was like, Ricky Gervais, ladies and gentlemen. Touche. I said, oh, <laughs> my God. The fact that I was like, that's a crazy quote. He's like, yeah, science, all the books would end up being exactly the same because all of the science would literally be exactly the same as we learned. But now, in a reset, would your book be the same? Same story? I'm like, oh, that's interesting. That's pretty cool. I never thought of it like that. Yeah. Hey, can I put a pause in real quick? Yeah. I, 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 sorry. You okay? I'm fine. I'm just curious how much time you have left. I have like a good half an hour, 45 minutes. Okay, we can cool. Get into the review. Right on. Just making sure. I like where uh, this is going, is all. I'm like, I don't really give a shit about this movie. <laughs> but we, <I'm> like, <laughs> I, did, okay, I watched the, I, I hope we're still going. I did watch the movie for, for Dan. And uh, I do have thoughts I want to say about. Um, the movie, dude. Okay. Let's, let's wait a second because I, I yeah. wanted to take this into a different direction because I talked yes, about please. this on the last episode. Joe. Yes. Yeah. I know that you watched alone. Yes. Yeah. And I, I, I was able to watch the first few episodes of that, the season that you guys reviewed. Okay. Yes. I am of the belief that you would be perfect for this. Maybe <laughs> I'm wrong. See, you're, you're, correct me if I'm wrong. You're an outdoorsy guy, right? Yeah. You like to climb rocks and all that kind of stuff. And I'm, I'm imagining that you're a camper. Yes. Yeah. I, I can get by out in the woods, but the, I, I love sleeping with a fan on. So there's a, you know, there's a certain amount of misery. To, to yes. Me camping. Join I hear club. you. Yeah, no, I'm with you. <laughs> T- type two fun. It's fun after the fact. <laughs> I'm totally a fan of glamping. Fuck that shit. Give me an RV and cable. <laughs> I'm good to go. But I'm of the opinion that I, th- I think you could do this. Do I, am I reading you wrong? Oh, okay. Well, just in comparing to where they were like cold weather. Yes. I know it's extreme. Camping like that. Like that would be, that'd be, t- I, you couldn't just pluck me out of my bedroom right now and toss me up there w- with my 10 items. Like I I'd have to like prepare and research for it. Cause I don't know. I don't know enough survivalist skills to like how to like live off certain plants and stuff like that. Right. Um, I for sure would be able to build, you know, like a good shelter and, and survive for a little while, but is, like, I don't think it's a, a, a scenario I could flourish in, <laughs> <laughs> but I think I would be better than the average person for sure. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I really feel I have that kind of confidence in you. I was just wondering because, and I don't know why, because obviously we don't, I mean, we know each other, but we don't know each other well. But when I was watching this, you just kept popping up in my head. I'm like, I think Joe could fucking do it. You, you said something about that the last time. I'm we were serious, on, we were, I don't yeah, know why. Just, like, just know I have confidence in you, sir. <laughs> Oh, I appreciate that. <laughs> what was funny is when we were watching it, like everyone in my family voted that I would be the one. They're like, oh, daddy could do that. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, uh, I appreciate the vote of confidence. <laughs> Here, here's my problem. I would, I would go and I would be like, A, how do I build shelter? Don't know how to do that. B, what kind of water can I drink? Can I drink the snow water? I doubt it. Is this clear water? Is this right? I don't know. So already it's T minus till I get picked up. Because I don't, I'm just, I'd be, I'd be spinning my wheels in my brain and not doing anything. Sometimes pe- some people I know can spin their wheels while acting. They're like, I wonder if this will work. For me, I have to have it all together. Yeah, I don't have that kind of brain. <laughs> yeah, I got to have it all together and then be like, okay, now act. But if my wheels are spinning, I will sit there and not do anything and be like, oh crap, how do I do, wait, how do I do? Some people just move. And as they're messing up, they're figuring it out. Dude, I can't do that. That's me, dude. I'm really good at thinking on my feet and on the fly and thinking around corners and stuff like that. Oh, you would do fine then, dude. You would win. <laughs> what are you talking <laughs> about I right know now? About win, but <laughs> you could kill so, a if moose. you just like gave me like a Rambo knife and you're like, go find the right 
like plants in here to eat and there's poisonous ones mixed in. Like, I don't want to end up like that guy in Into the Wild. <laughs> you ain't even lying. I was I just read up on that's so weird you bring him up. I read an article this week about him. They yeah. changed the reason he died. Oh, and now what are they saying? What what okay, so n- before they said he accidentally ate a bad some bad uh plant or a bad seed, right? Mm-hmm. Now they're saying he didn't. He actually ate some sort of potato weed or something like that, where in most human beings, we have enough body fat that it absorbs it. And we don't even feel it. He didn't have enough body fat. And so it immediately turned poisonous to him. And what it does, once it becomes poison to your body, it makes you paralyzed. So he couldn't move and he ended up starving. And, and uh, Oh my God, that's miserable. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's miserable. It's a miserable death. And I was like, well, that didn't make it any any better at all. Maybe it was like but, gypsum weed. And he just jumped off funny. a fucking cliff because he ate too much. <laughs> it, it was a sad death. And I felt horrible for the guy because it's like, we all could eat that and we're fine because we have enough body mass. I mean, but he was on, you know, he was so skinny that he just didn't have it. But anyway, I would say that like if I, I would say I'm gonna I'm gonna go on a limb. I'm saying obviously between the three of us, Stark wins. Stark wins. I'm going gonna, home the day it starts. That's not true, Dan. You're you're lasting a, a week. I'm like, nah, I'm good. Dan, you're well, first of all, I'd never week. send in an audition tape because I just know that I would never do that shit. That's the thing. <laughs> We're talking you're you're talking about the scenario of, you know, well, maybe I don't have any training or anything like that. Well, they're not gonna take us, right? Like I'm saying if forced, if we were, three were in the woods, it would be stark. Probably not. We would be home having a podcast being like, is Stark back? I hope he's okay. (laughs) Did he he come back? (laughs) Because you you would be like, for for Joe, he's like, oh, I just started having fun. What are y'all doing? We're (laughs) home already. Chilling. We already went to In-N-Out with their terrible fries. Joe's got a log cabin built. (laughs) Yeah. Like, I'm working on the second story of my house. (laughs) Yeah, you're already doing. And he's wondering, I wonder how the the fellas are doing. Yeah, we're home. Posted and pivoting. Eating a sandwich. uh, uh, Dan, I think you last a week. I would be miserable. I'll give myself some credit and think that I, I really could survive out there for probably a week, but I think that would be the absolute max. And I'm sure I would do something to fucking injure myself. That would be my downfall right there. I'd be, I would be the guy that breaks his leg. For sure. Otherwise, you'd be able to stay longer. I would, I would stay for as long as I could go without food and water, which is not very long at all. And I'd just be home because I just wouldn't know how to hunt for anything. I don't know how to get water from, nothing, from anything. I would just be like, okay, I'm not, I'm not ready for this. What, what, what am I doing here? And so I'd go home. <laughs> you, Dan, could, would hurt himself. Yeah, and for then sure. Come home for sure. You get you get on the plane, and I'd be like, so what did you break? What happened? What, what, what didn't what, what, I break, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> I'm good for an ankle fracture probably every two years. Like I have one coming up, I'm sure. So yeah, I would be terrible at that. And then Stark, he's there for a month. He's chilling. He's fine. You're fine. Did you ever I, finish it? I've not finished it yet, um, but I'm I'm going to because what I've watched so far has been riveting. It's I've just been um, had busy evenings so far this week, so I haven't been able to pick back up on it yet. What about you, Steve? What, um, I didn't finish it. I got to the part where I'm not gonna I'm not gonna spoil it, but uh, uh, somebody I really liked left, and I was like, oh, this sucks. But the I'm to the last two people, and okay. I'm like, oh, this is shot. I did not see this coming. I thought for sure somebody else would be there because, well, it made sense. It made sense. But um, it was it was so far the moose thing is the only thing that bothered me. I didn't like that at all. I think it was just unnecessarily gruesome and mean. But uh, uh, I did like one of the. Um, they're doing magic, dude, the way that they're making these 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 traps i'm like dude how did you even know how to do this like who like how are you doing this those are people that were in the scouts and just taking survival classes man i don't even know how to make a snare how do you do that dude i don't i bet know, you joe knows bro. how to make a snare of course <laughs> yeah snare traps are pretty basic see there like, yeah, no big deal. <laughs> Back in, but you want one here i got three i just made three right now while you were talking but, but like i learned things about it just watching i think that first episode when the guy was talking about the style of snare traps he was making where it was like the 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 long log that like leans against the tree, right? And then uh, the other one that they did, where it was the the log that was in the water that caught the fish. I'd never seen those before. That was pretty either. dope. That was pretty dope. Some of these dudes, the way they're catching fish on the show, like 
I, I don't know. I'm not going to say who, but there's this one part where this guy, he goes, oh man, I, I don't, I guess I'm going to go fishing now. I'm having bad luck the other way. So he just goes out there. He has what I think is just some string with him. And that's it. Yes. Maybe a hook. The next thing you know, because he's so badass, he made like a fucking, he's got an actual reel. Like he made a fucking reel and is like pulling back, fighting a fish. That's unbelievable. <laughs> that's some, and that's when I'm like, okay, that's the guy. That's the one. So these guys are, are like, there's certain people. I remember uh, my ex-wife's uh, going to my ex-wife's father's house or parents' house. And I was there and um, I was like, so how long have you had the house? And he said, oh, I built it about such and such years ago. I'm like, pause the game. What did you talk about? He's like, I built it. I built it myself. I was like, who taught you how to do building? He's like, nobody. Just, you know, you start, put the concrete thing down and you start. I'm like, it's not up to code, but it looks pretty good. <laughs> it's amazing. It's a house. It's a big ranch house. And I was like, and then you're like, you just learn as you go. I said, people like that. And then the people that are like in the woods, it's magic, dude. What they're doing is total magic. And I don't think people understand, like Stark would be out there being like, yeah, I made a, a trap, caught some fish, drank some water, chilled, made a cabin, avoided some bears, shot a moose. And I'd be like, <laughs> gee, you're doing magic right now. You are doing, for me, it's, I just couldn't, it's not magic that works in my brain. My brain doesn't work with that kind of magic. I wish I could. I wish I could do that sort of magic, but it's just not so I, I, I think Dan could do a lot better than he thinks he can. I don't know. I, really do. I don't have a lot of faith in myself. But I do know that if we left Joe there and we just said, we'll come back in like two days just to check on you. Oh, dear. We would come back. All that shit would be built. And he'd be wearing like a fucking Wolverine pelt. Like this? <laughs> Very nice, huh? It's not dry yet, but it's, it's, gonna, it's a good, it's a work in progress. I think Joe could do it. Say, in, in two days, I'd for sure have a shelter built. There'd be a fire going all the time. And I'd probably be eating fish because I know how to spear fish. Jesus Christ. Jesus, dude. dude spearing even... fish is fun. That was one of the most primal things I've ever done. Where'd you do that? A uh, little farm pond outside of the, the, the small town that I grew up in. Uh, so the way that, that the interstate uh, system goes through Iowa, you know, they're built on the raised roadbeds. And so you're periodically see these ponds right alongside the, the interstate system where they dug big holes in the ground to build up these raised road beds. And usually the digging stopped when they'd hit the water table around 30 or 40 feet down or so. And so there's all these really nice freshwater ponds that are filled with like filtered spring water that are all along the interstates in Iowa. And there was one in particular that I used to go to for fishing in high school. And I noticed that there were these giant carp in the fit in the pond that were like four feet long. And growing up, dad, my dad had a carp spear out in the garage and he'd tell me stories about how, oh yeah, you just go out in the river bottoms after it floods and these big carp will go up into the river bottoms and then they'll get trapped in these ephemeral ponds that, you know, the ponds will eventually dry up after the, the flood water goes down. But for a little while, they're teeming with life. And so you could go back into the river bottoms and spear these carp. And then there was old timers down by the river that had a big like smoker set up where they'd smoke the carp and everything. And I, I heard, grew up, hearing stories about it from my dad, but dad never wanted to smoke a car because he was like, ah, fuck that. That's a bony fish and I don't want to clean it. And so I was just fascinated with these stories of spearing carp. And so when I saw these big carp at this pond, I immediately drove home. And so <laughs> at the time I got a 1988 Honda Accord in this uh, carp spear. It, it's it got a, like a, a four tined prong at the end, kind of like, um, you know, like, uh, like what um, Aquaman would use. That's exactly or something what like I that. was picturing. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's got a big long wooden pole on it. That's probably about 10 feet long. And so I got this 88 Accord, but it has a moonroof in it. And so I just got this carp spear sticking up out of the moonroof. So it looks like, like a mast of like a ship. And I do like the 30 minute drive to go to this pond. And, and so I'm walking along with the spear. And every time I get up to the bank where there's a carp at it immediately, just turns tail and disappears into the water. And so I'm like, shit, man, it's like either they're seeing me or they're sensing vibrations through the ground. And so I realized that I'm not going to be able to just stand on the bank and just spear it. I'm going to have to actually like eyeball where one is at, calculate about how many yards that is away, and then walk back like 20 yards from the edge of the water and then parallel it. And then when I think I'm about where it's at, I need to raise the spear up over my shoulder like I'm going to throw it 
and then just creep right up to the edge of the lake. And sure enough, the carp was right there. I didn't scare it. And so then leap forward and jump down into the water and spear it and then lift that big hog out of the water. Dude, it was primal. It was so much fun. That sounds fucking dope. I would love to do that. Yeah. I love killing animals, Steve. Did you know that? (laughs) Well, carper, they... It's I'm okay to do it with the carp because they're they're like a overpopulated fish. Like oh, they'll I'm, ruin I'm, a pond. I'm totally kidding, but it's just that Steve won't kill a fly. That's why I was <laughs> I saying. I will that. not. I will. And here's here's the funny part. If you if you sent me into a a store, a spear store, and they're like, you have to kill carp with a spear, and they said, Steve, what kind of spear do you need? <laughs> I wouldn't even think a carp spear. I wouldn't put the two together. I'd be like, I don't know, a spear is a spear. Give me whatever spear. <laughs> but like, you're, sir, you're, you're hunting carp, sir. What kind of spear do you think? Like a spear? I don't know. I didn't know a carp spear was a thing. Uh, is there a salmon spear? Hmm. Hmm. I don't know. I think, I think that they would be too low to catch. You'd have to be a, have a really long-ass spear. But then again, if you're doing it in a, like in a creek or something like that, there must be, you know, I bet you you could use the same spear, Steve. I think a spear is a spear. Yeah, a spear. I mean, it's if it's if it's pointy, and you can push I, it against I something. Think, <laughs> I think it is. It's funny. Joe's like, you guys are fucking me. stupid. It reminds me. I, <laughs> well, I, I grew I, up around this shit, so I don't think you're stupid. I just <laughs> I just grew up like country, basically. <laughs> <laughs> well, the weird I'm such thing is a I, city boy. It's I used to fish in San Luis. We'd go to the creek and we'd fish. Yeah, I heard about your creek. And- <laughs> that's what you're calling it huh fishing uh, we did it though and i and the only reason i fish is i told dan this i think i said it on the podcast because uh my dad tried to bond with me we went fishing one time and i was like don't these fit doesn't this hurt fish and he's like no 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 no. just calm down fish have such small brains that they don't feel pain and i was like oh that makes sense and so later on in life i'm sitting there with a friend and he's like Steve, do you ever think that these fish, like, were really hurting them? And I was like, gee, just easy. Fish are so dumb, they don't feel pain. And only then did I think, I was like, that is the dumbest thing that someone's ever told me. And I almost repeated it. He just wanted to keep you there. That's it. <laughs> that is it. And I almost repeated it until my my grown-up brain had to shut up my little kid. Be like, dude, we've grown out of that already. That's not a thing. There's a reason they run away from the... <laughs> From the, the thing, because it hurts. I'm like, dang. I, and I fished all the way to that day. Because I always thought they did, were too dumb to feel pain. And that day I stopped fishing. I can just picture that day your dad's like, all right, I got a bond with this kid. Everything I throw at him, he's got some kind of counter because he's Steve Hudson. So Bingo. you know what? <laughs> I mean, I really can't get in this kid's mind. Fishing. Fishing is the bonding point. I love fishing. Let's go fishing. He gets there, gets him all set up, casts, and, and Steve goes, but does it hurt the fish? And he's like, mother. Oh, for, dude, I have no, word. it I, doesn't <laughs> just, just fish kid. Shut up and fish. We're bonding. When he was first going to marry my mother, let me tell you how bad it was. She, he took me to, um, he took me to, um, like a Dodger game right behind the batter. I don't even know what you call those seats. <laughs> and I was there and he's like, having fun. I'm like, not really. No, I don't like baseball. Nice, Steve. That was great. Like, <laughs> way, to, way to adapt. Way to throw your dad a fucking bone, Steve. Jesus. Do you see what I'm dealing with, Joe, on a week to week basis? That's classic. That's what this whole, it. that's what Heroes of Noise is. I, I really do think at, at the at the center of it, it's just trying to fucking crack Steve and see what he's about. That's my Dude. mission anyway. I <laughs> love that I've met all these wonderful people along the way, but that's really what I'm going for. I want to figure it out. Maybe you're the key, Joe. I think you can pull it out of him. You're still working towards that soft, chewy center. You talked Jesus. about earlier. A one, now it's like a 17, a 35. Yeah, and, uh, I wasn't buying it, man. And when he told me there were nine innings, I was like, nigga. <laughs> we, we, so each inning is them going back and forth, and that's one? I'm like, oh, my God. That was the worst, dog. And I have a feeling that's exactly how it went. I really Oh, for believe. sure. <laughs> we never, after that, it was just, we just never, until I moved out when I was 18, we just never, we realized that around then we're like, oh, we just are never going to click. And then he said, let me try again with this fishing thing. Let me, let me go out there and actually give it another go. Latch, di- last ditch like, effort. 
Yep. And after that, he's like, okay, all right, well, we're just, we're just not, we're not, we're, we're too different. And so it's not going to happen. But now we get along. Fu- did I tell you, bro? What? Oh my God, bro. How did I tell you? I get a text from dad and he's like, hey, Steve, how are you? I was like, I'm doing just marvelously. And he says, so um, I have a rock I need help moving. I said, oh, word? He's like, yeah, I got it from Home Depot. Can you help me? I said, for sure. I was like, or I could just send Maj. He's like, nah, it's a bit too big for Maj. So I'm like, okay, cool. I'll be there in a bit. And I get a text from my mom. He's like, have you seen this rock? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, mom, why are you? T-? I'm fine. She's like, okay, okay. So I get to the house. I look at the back of his truck. This isn't a rock, Dan. It's a freaking boulder. <laughs> and I said, um, how, how did you get it up on the, um, how many men did it take to get up on the, on the truck? He's like, oh, they used a crane. I said, oh, we're the dumb ones then. Yeah. <laughs> so you're going to be We're the idiots that are going to try to take it off. And so he's like, all right, ready? Here we go. God. <laughs> and that's why I had an MRI. <laughs> Dan. <laughs> L45, blown out. We start pulling it off of the truck. I said, how much does this, this weigh? He's like, 375. And I said, Dad, have you, have, do you know how much three? He's like, you benched that, right? I said, you think I benched 375? <laughs> you think I benched 375? No. He's like, oh, it's, it's not going to be that heavy. Let me tell you something. We might as well have dropped it off the edge of that truck. Because our muscles did not stop the drop. Did it break at all? No, it, it landed. It scraped down his arms and landed onto, luckily landed onto the hand truck. I said, are you okay? my Dude, my back, G. When I was going down, it literally felt like a thousand things popped on the way down. Because I was trying to keep my back straight. It was like all the way down. I said, that's going to be felt when I'm 50. Whatever just happened here is going to be felt when I'm 50. You're not so, lying, G. It's going to come back and bite you. So we truck it to the backyard. I said, what are we using this for? He's like, ah, just somewhere to sit. <laughs> I said, I'm sorry. <laughs> He's like, you know, like under that tree, people probably will sit on this rock. I said, good news, bad news. No one's going to sit on this rock. <laughs> so we're taking it there for nothing is what you're telling me. He's like, no, no, no. So we roll it into this space. And I'm like, all right, dad, thanks. He's like, no, wait. He steps back 20 feet and eyes it. Hmm. Hmm. Sit on that rock real quick, Steve. Let me get a gander. No, that's exactly (laughs) what he did. He's like, hey, go sit on it real quick. And I sit on it. And he's like, "Uh, hey, come help me slide it over. I was like, listen, (laughs) what are we doing? He barely twists it. He's like, all right. He stands back. Hey, go sit on that. I'm like, is this? Am I on candy camera? Is this like a joke we're doing? And he's like, you know what? I'll, I'll do the rest. You go ahead. Thank you. I appreciate your help. His arm's bleeding. <laughs> and I was like, mom. She said, I asked you if you saw it. That's why I texted you I and warned asked you. you if you saw this. Because <laughs> I said no. She, uh, he asked for my mom's help with it. <laughs> and she came out and looked. She's like, no. No, I'm not going to try that. Dan, what is up with older men thinking that they are He-Man? I don't know. I'm starting to get that way, I think. The older I get, I'm starting to think some <laughs> stupid shit. <laughs> so, I, don't know. I, think, I think there's just part, like, there's just little pieces of protective layer on our brain that are shedding away each time. And these little protective bears are what keep our, our inner thoughts in and keep our weird ideas in. And I think that as they flake away, as you, as the brain demyelinates, if you will, Steve. Oh, wait a minute, I Dan. Think Can you break that down for the listener, please? Sure, Steve. You have a myelin sheath that wraps around your nerves. There's also a, uh, uh, it's a myelin sheath that wraps around the brain as well. Now, people that have MS, that's what's happening. The myelin sheath is breaking down, demyelinating, exposing your brain. And oh. you start to have, you start to have, you know, adverse effects. But I, anyway. Dan? Nice. So, but I'm not saying that everyone has MS, Steve. I'm just thinking that I know that. There's a term when we're scanning patients and they're like, you know, 85 and you look and you see these characteristics that, that co- go with like MS that I've heard it referred to many times. I'm not saying it's a technical term, but I've heard it referred to many times by different radiologists. That's just old brain. So my theory is that's what happens. That little protective layer just starts to wear off and, and the dumb thoughts come out. 
You know what I mean? Your inhibition's lower and you just, that's why I think you have, you see so many, and I'm serious about this. That's why, uh, I don't want to make this sound like I'm going for just Trump people, but so let's, let's leave out the, like the social climate right now. But I think that's why you see a lot of like people that are 65 and older saying a bunch of stupid shit all the time, like in stores or that uncle that comes over and just doesn't know what, like can't read the room like at Thanksgiving or something. I really do think there's something to that. I wouldn't be surprised, dude. And it's funny. Uh, so uh, on the topic of medical stuff, I almost texted you this week because I learned something crazy. First of all, right? you've got to stop asking me for medical advice because I'm not that person. I'm going to, I'm going to steer you in the wrong direction. So I was reading something and uh, it was talking about um, all the things that happen when we throw a ball. And it's weird. We were just talking about um, evolution. They were saying that throwing things is, was a huge part of how we evolved. The fact that we learned how to throw stuff. Because he was like, in order for you to throw a ball, um, you know it takes, like, even though it's super quick, it takes a while for your thoughts to hit your nerves to send messages to your extremities, right? So he's like, when you take a ball and you throw it overhand, he says, your brain has sent the message to release the ball before you're even before your arm is done throwing. It's already sent the message to release. And he's like, it happens at such a precise moment. That's the, it's the equivalent of being on a 10 story building, having a song start, you dropping a drumstick and it hitting the snare drum at the exact point of the song perfectly. And you do that every single time you throw a ball. I said, are you going to tell me? I didn't know this for 42 years. I'm sitting there thinking that, A, we were created knowing how to throw things. That's just not how. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, it can't have happened like that. Steve Hudson, shower thoughts. <laughs> I was like, we couldn't have been just created knowing how to throw things. We evolved learning how to. As, and he's like, when we learned how to throw, the theory is our brain immediately started changing. When we learned how to do things like that. That first time a big ass dinosaur came up on one of us. We got to throw Listen, something. Bro. Listen, bro. Hey. Okay, we're not going to do this. We got to get into the because okay. we haven't even done the content. <laughs> yeah, you know, I wanted to. Yeah, if I can, I want to steer the show back real quick because we yeah, do have do some it. things to talk about. So if you don't mind, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to give you some contact information. Guess what? You'll probably hear everything. These guys aren't going to hear shit. Hey, what's going on? This is Dan from Heroes of Noise. You're probably hearing music. These guys aren't. But I have some information for you. I'd like to pass it along. So if you'll just oblige me, I'm going to go ahead and do that right now. Right? Entertain Dan. That's what he needs right now. If you want to get a hold of the show, hit us up at Heroes of Noise Podcast at gmail.com. That is Heroes of Noise Podcast at gmail.com. On Twitter, hit us up at Heroes of Noise. You can reach me, Dan, at Dan Q Public and Steve at SE underscore Hudson Music. Go to www.heroesofnoise.com, and there you're going to find everything, including voicemails, uh, places to leave us an email. You can subscribe to shows, much like uh, you can just subscribe to Cat. You know what? Subscribe to Starcast. Will you? Subscribe to number one comic books. It's there. You can do that. And I think if it's not, I'll put it there. That's how strongly I feel about this, all right? Subscribe to those shows. Subscribe to ours if you haven't yet. And of course, join the Heroes of Noise podcast community on Facebook. It's a great place, great people. We keep all the assholes out. I'm going to turn it back over to my man, Steve motherfucking Hudson. Dan and Joe Steezy. <laughs> we have watched some things this week. We're going to talk about all of them? I'm happy to. I can't talk about all of them. I didn't think so. So Because I have to go to work, you know? Let's do a quick little, we're going to keep it on the show, behind the scenes, a little brainstorming here. I know what we're going to talk about mainly. Joe, do you have yes. anything? I, I just listened to you. <laughs> I know you've watched a ton <laughs> of shit because I just listened to you. So I think a lot of this, the homework is going to be done, okay? Sure. But Steve, what have yeah. you watched? We could do like a little lightning round of things. Okay, um... I watched a uh, show called America to Me, and what it is is oh, remember uh, remember that documentary, um, Hoop Dreams? Yes. Same guy followed kids uh, for four years of high school, and it's in a very white area of Chicago, and these are black students in this white area of Chicago, and it's about how the discrepancy of how you know they're treated or what the white students think. They follow the students, not the parents. They talk to the students about how you know things are going, and they talk to some of the teachers and stuff like that. And it's just watching them grow up on the show and how they're navigating this interesting point of life. And 
how all the students are learning about racial inequalities and learning about these things and how some students you can tell, oh, this person's going to be someone at like Goldman Sachs. He's a douche. This kid is just meant to do that sort of thing. There's no getting through to him. And there's, there's some kids that actually do learn and say, you know what? We have to change the world. And I'm just like, oh, look at them wanting to change the world. <laughs> and they believe it. They're like, I'm going to make a difference. And I was like, this is adorable. So that's America to me. I watched that. And the only other thing worth talking about is a m- movie we all watched. Okay. All right. Uh, Joe, do you have anything that maybe you watched recently that you want to talk about? Um, I haven't been watching too much recently, but I've been reading a lot of comic books this week and I've been catching up on, uh, Scott Snyder and Greg Capullo's run on Batman. So this is the new 52 Batman books. And I just read volumes four and five last night. I believe it goes 10 volumes total. Um, but, uh, the, the stuff that Scott Snyder and Greg Capullo did with the character during the new 52 is, is fantastic. If you're a Batman fan or if, if you're, a comic fan and you, you know, you, you've wanted to get into a character, but you don't really know where to start. Cause it can be super overwhelming. Uh, if you like Batman, I highly recommend, uh, starting with, uh, the court of owls, which is volume one of the new 52 Batman. Nice. That's interesting. You said, talked about, uh, uh, comics. I spent most of last week catching up, even though I know nobody reads it on Marvel zombies. I read all of the Marvel zombies. So good. Oh, nice. Is that so- a Mark Miller book? Uh, different people actually. Okay. They had like one. Uh, one of them was by Kirkman. Oh, cool. It was good. Anyway, <laughs> that was good. Anyway, go ahead. I'll take a stab at this. I actually watched a screener for something that comes out on Ooh. July first. Did you guys used to watch Unsolved Mysteries? Yeah. I did. So they have this back now. It's coming back July first on Netflix. Mm-hmm. And um, I used to love that show. I think like the the thing that really made it kind of creepy for me was Robert Stack's narration. Because he talked like this and he talked about how these things could happen. And on this date, you know what I mean? He he had, he was like breaking it down for you as you're going along with the show. Unfortunately, that's kind of gone away. Like it's still interesting things that they're talking about. But if you recall, the old episodes used to have multiple stories all in one episode. Yes. So that's gone too. They're now focusing on a, you know, what they're doing is they're taking stories from a few years ago because, you know, it gives them time to research it and have evidence Mm -hmm. and things like that. And they're just focusing on one episode, excuse me, one uh, incident for the entire episode, which is around a little, probably just close to an hour. Jesus Christ. Still has the creepy music. So that's still there, but there's no narration anymore. And I'm not going to say it's a bad show. It's just that it's not a bad show. It's actually entertaining. If you like those kind of documentary style shows, it's fine. It talks about some very interesting things, but to me, it just doesn't feel like unsolved mysteries anymore. Totally fair. You know what I mean? It just seems like a like your standard any like any documentary that you go to on Netflix that's in a series form. That's what it seems like to me. Uh, the first one was pretty interesting. It talks about this guy who was you know a family man. He had no issues that they were aware of, no ties to anything illegal or whatever. But he goes missing, and after six days, they find his car next to this building. I think it was in Los Angeles. That's the part I didn't pay that much attention to, but I think it was in Los Angeles. Anyway. Uh, they find his, his car and he's nowhere to be found. And long story short, what happens is there's this big ass building, uh, like a hotel that's right next to this parking garage. So mm-hmm. they decided to go up to this parking garage just to kind of get like an eagle's eye look of the place. And they see this hole mm-hmm. that's in the like like one of the level roofs of that hotel. Mm-hmm. So long story short, they find this dude and it looks like he has just like fallen and landed. He went through a steel roof and he landed and they, this, this maintenance guy found him and he was all like decomposed and everything like that. And just his body was just obliterated. But there were like his phone was fine. His glasses were fine. His flip flops. They keep talking about the flip flops were pretty much in check. Basically, it doesn't seem like he it's like that shouldn't happen. Almost like he was placed there. But obviously mm-hmm. there was a hole in the roof. It made it made sense that he'd fallen from there. But they start doing like the logistics of how he could fall. And none, none of it makes sense. My theory, and they didn't talk about this, is that someone, like, I don't know what this guy did or what he was up to or what he uncovered or whatever, but I think it seems to me like the most logical thing would be dropped from like a helicopter. If that's the case, that he's falling in this direct pattern where you just can't match up the angles, that's the only thing that makes sense to me, yet they didn't talk about it. So that's the first one. It's it's pretty interesting. And then the second one I won't really talk about, but it has to do with these uh, these young kids that all had a paranormal experience with extraterrestrials. And then they're talking about it later on. 
and they're all sharing their experiences. So it's still unsolved mysteries in that fashion, but it's just, it just doesn't feel like the original show anymore, except for say the, the music. And no Robert Stack narration because Robert Stack's dead, but they didn't decide to, you know, like fill him, <laughs> like replace him, basically. He's, they're just, uh, here you go. Here's this documentary. Watch it. So it's decent. Um, I'll go ahead and just give it uh, three out of five. No, no, I'm sorry. I'm going to give it two out of five. The fuck am I going to give this show? Yeah, I'll give it two out of five. Um, it's just a two out of five. I got nothing witty for you today. Okay, cool. Yeah. Also, I don't know if the helicopter thing tracks because his phone and his glasses are okay. That's the thing. That's why it's an unsolved mystery, Steve. Now you're you're picking up what I'm putting down here. I don't know. No one knows <laughs> what's going on with this it. show. Yeah. It's quite peculiar. And then the other thing that I watched last night, I only watched one episode of it uh, in detail, is season two of The Twilight Zone. Episode one, it's called Meet in the Middle, and it stars Jimmy Simpson and Jillian Jacobs. And what this one's about is this, this guy that can never successfully have a date. He can't ever have a relationship because he always has like this you remember that, that movie shallow how mm-hmm. so yeah. he's kind of got that he, he's putting women too high up like the bar's too high so he's never satisfied and he's socially awkward so he goes to this therapist talking to her and then suddenly he hears like a hello in his head and he has no idea where this is coming from and he's freaking out and uh what the story is about is he establishes this, this like weird connection where only he can hear this person the other person can hear, can hear him and she turns out to be like the girl of his dreams kind of thing like that. You know, she gets everything that he's into. And, you know, it's a perfect relationship. If you want to call that a perfect relationship, they end up meeting. They decide to meet from two different you know parts of the country and they meet in the middle. And that's when things get really crazy. And of course, I won't give you the spoiler, but it was a pretty damn good episode. I would have to say that uh, season two of Twilight Zone is like jumping off at a very good pace right now. I highly recommend watching season one if you haven't watched it yet. It's on CBS All Access totally worth it um i will give meat in the middle three out of five voices in my dome that's have you by any chance have you seen that etheria on shutter yet no but i did see the uh little thumbnail for it do you know what that is i don't like there's an actual they have to they, when i first started it a woman is on screen saying we normally have a festival with women in horror that they do they do these shorts but since it's covid they can't do it so it's just a bunch of, of 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 women who created these horror shorts, and um, I didn't know that's what it was. I thought it was a cartoon. It's just a bunch of really good horror shorts that women. I was like, I didn't even know you guys had a festival. Definitely want to contact them. I didn't even know that they had that. I was one. I was like, I bet you Dan saw this poster and passed by it like I did. No, I, I mean I saw it, but I just I guess I did. I just passed by it. I didn't really pay that much attention to it, but I do really know what good. you're talking about. They did a really good job. Hey, there's another um, one that I would really like to talk about, but and I know Joe's seen this, but it would take us into a very long conversation, I think. And it's on Amazon Prime right now. I'm just going to tell you you should watch this movie. It's fucking intense as shit, and it's called 7500, starring Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Joe, I know you already talked about this, but real quickly, what did you think of this? Dude, this movie was very intense. Um, the The entire movie takes place in the cockpit of a, a commercial airliner, and yeah, I the the movie like <laughs> I spent the entire movie pacing back and forth watching it. I could, I couldn't have imagined like being confined to a theater seat and, and watching this. I mean this this movie sent me through an entire range of emotions, um, mostly intense, but man, it's got it's got some parts in it that are really make you tear up as well. And, and George, Joseph Gordon Levitt's performance in it was absolutely fantastic. Uh, the movie didn't have a score, which was really interesting. So yeah. everything was just the ambient noise of, of an, of an airliner. And, um, and wouldn't you say that that makes it even more intense because you're, yes. you're, you're forced to focus on what's going on versus being distracted by the music. And I know the music can kind of take you places, but that's just raw what's going on right there. Yeah. So, I mean, the whole gist of this movie is that right after this flight takes off going from Berlin to Paris, um, it, it, uh, terrorists attack the plane and try and force their way into the cabin and they eventually get the cabin door shut. And, and then the movie's just kind of a standoff from there with, with these terrorists that, that they have like improvised weapons that are shards of glass with like tape wrapped around his handles and they're they're threatening to murder passengers if if the captain does or if the pilot doesn't open the door, but you know per airline regulations he he can't open the door, and 
Oh man, that it's, leads to some very jacked up situations. It, extremely, and it, this movie is fantastic. If you have Amazon Prime, don't sleep on it. Uh, definitely check it out. Want to give it a rating, Joe? I would. I I would give it a five out of five uh, improvised shanks. Nice. I'm going to go the same. Five out of five tough protocol decisions. Ooh, that's better. Oh. Yeah. You guys got to peep this movie. Seriously, it's really good. I could spend a lot of time talking about it, but we're going someplace. Find out for yourself and then hit us up and let us know what you think. Heroes of Noise podcast at gmail.com. Thank you very much. Two more things. And I'm just going to say I liked them. I didn't love them. Um, actually, I did kind of love one of them. But Floor is Lava. I watched that on Netflix. And it's just this, like game show. If you're into... What are those rooms called? Uh, escape rooms. Thank you. If you're into escape rooms, puzzles and things like that, and and team solving projects, this is it's pretty fun. I will say that it kind of just gets monotonous after a while, and you're just like, okay, it's same thing over and over again. It's got some kind of lame contestants on it, and the host is real great. I'm not <laughs> selling this show, but I'm telling you, if you just kind of take all that out and just entertain yourself with how they figure out these, basically what it is, it's a room filled with lava. Uh, water, I guess is what it is. And uh, you have to just solve these puzzles to get across from one side of the room to the other. And it takes teamwork. And if you fall into the lava, that's it. But you have three chances because there's always three people with them. And that's pretty much the gist of the show. I know I'm going really quickly on this one. It's good. It's not great. I'll give it a solid two out of five lame contestants. Yeah, and then, I, I'd give it that same rating. And But however, my kids love it. And they both gave it a four out of five. You know, the thing is, it's like, it's kind of cool to watch with your family because that's how we were. I was me, my daughter and Gail, we were watching it and we, we were thoroughly entertained. But just after a while, I just kind of fell out of it and started looking at my phone because it just became the same thing over and over again, you know? Yeah, I totally agree. <laughs> and the host and contestants are pretty, a lot of the contestants are pretty annoying. Yeah, and, there's and, a few good ones. But then I, re- <laughs> well, let's see, who did, who really just bugged the shit out of me? It was the first family the daughter was kind of a douche because she wasn't really participating that well. Yes. <laughs> and mom was into it too. Like mom was, you could tell mom stays in shape. She's an attractive woman. She's like, she oh yeah, mom thing. crushed it. Yeah. Mom was killing it. <laughs> and, the, and the son was killing it too, but the daughter was just being a douche and not really. And she's the first one. Well, who cares? She's the first one to go. Uh, <laughs> I love the episode with the flight attendants though. I was so happy. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. That was a good one. The other one I liked were the, uh, I think they were cousins, the three cousins, the, the three black dudes. Yes, they did yeah. really well together too. They were great too, yeah. <laughs> and then the what was the other one? Uh, the one that bugged me the most though, there was these triplets. Oh yes, yeah. They, they were all wearing American flag tank tops, and they were so, three identical it, yeah, triplets. Yeah, instantly I'm already st- out. Oh, they were so douchey. <laughs> yeah, but you know, it's entertainment. I guess you could say it's something that if you have nothing to do, Steve, maybe you're folding some laundry or something like that. Check it out. It's it's kind of interesting, but I think that the um, like the flavor doesn't last. You know what I'm saying? Steve, did we hit, did we lose you, Steve? Sometimes no, I thought, I thought you were talking to Stark since he watched. Oh it. no, I was just, I was trying to tell you in case you were interested in watching. I thought maybe you'd snuck off to take a dump or something like that. I was just making no. sure, making no, sure. No, 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 no. And then very quickly, uh, if you just like those kind of shows and you want to, you want to actually watch a good version of something like that. Season two of Holy Moly dropped on Hulu. And I fucking love that show. I just think it's, it's the same kind of thing. It's obstacle courses, but it's with miniature golf. And the hosts are great. Rob Riggle is on it, and he's fucking hilarious. And same idea. You have lame contestants that go on, but there's just something so entertaining about this show, and I laugh out loud every time I watch it. I will give that one a solid three out of five windmills to the torso. And now I'm done with my weekly reviews. All right, real quick, uh, we're going to go ahead and talk about the movie that just came out. It's one of those 1999 rentals because it didn't make it into the theater. It stars Kevin Bacon and Amanda Seyfried, and the movie is called You Should Have Left. Let's talk about that one real quick, guys. When he says 1999, he means that's the price. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not Sorry. The year. Yeah, you have to, you, <laughs> like the hunt cost 1999 to rent that one. Okay, there we go. Okay. I would have rented it. Yeah. You, well, anyway, let's talk about this one because that's the movie at hand. Uh, Steve, since you have uh, seven minutes left, sir, what do you think? When I first started this movie, first of all, it was a bit of a trickaroo. Uh, but when I, when I started it, I was like, okay, you know, I'm in, I'm, I'm, because I like horror. You know, I'm a horror person. Of course. It's my thing. And so I'm sitting there, uh, you know, Kevin Bacon, one thing, dude, the the relationship between the two of them, I don't know what they were thinking. Very unhealthy. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know why they thought this was a good idea. Amanda Seyfried is entirely too young for this man. Anyway, um, when it starts, okay, you have to be, you have to chill with this movie for a second. 
But once it starts going, it really starts going. And I thought it was I and you know I'm very crit, you know I'm I'm very critical about my horror movies. And this is technically a horror movie. I would call it more of a psychological thriller. Yeah. But I thought truthfully, dude, it had me till the end. And last night I was very tired and it woke me up. Like I was like, wait a minute, what's happening now? Like they because a lot of movies I watch, I'm just like, you should have dipped. That's what you should have dipped in. You should have dipped. That's what they should have called it. Technically, <laughs> they did the right thing here. What I don't like is they don't revisit any of the, like, uh, there's one per, a few people that know about this thing and they never revisit these people and been like, okay, maybe they could shed some light on this whole situation, but they just left them alone. But they did exactly what you were supposed to do. Things got weird. I'm going to dip. And I'm not going to tell you the rest, but they did kind of do something stupid. And even the daughter was like, why are we doing this? <laughs> like, what are we doing? Like, it's better just to do this than go, what are we doing right now? But um, all in all, dude, I thought it was a fun movie. I'm sad that I didn't get to see this in the theater. Right. I would have really had fun seeing this in the theater. All right. What are you rating? I know it's a quick review, but that's okay. Um... I will give it three out of five journal entries. Okay. Joe, what do you think? This movie, when I saw the trailer, the trailer freaked me out. Um, I, I watch some horror stuff, but I'm not the biggest horror fan. And my, my wife loves horror. And, and so uh, generally if I'm watching a movie like that, I'm watching it with her. And so we're watching it and through the majority of the movie, like I was really on edge, like lots of full body goosebump moments. Yeah. And it, it was very suspenseful, very suspenseful, very, very much a, a psychological suspenseful movie. And I totally agree with what you said before that um, Amanda Seyfried's character was just way too young for Kevin Bacon. <laughs> um, I, I, I gotta be honest though. I, I did not like the end of the movie, the way that it resolved, I thought was kind of dumb and I didn't like, the casting choice they did to, to let's just, let's just call it like the, the entity. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, yeah. I thought that was like, well, who's afraid of that? Can I ask but, you something real quick about that? Yeah. Did you know right away or did you, did you let the reveal happen at the end for you on that part? Um, but by the time it got to the reveal at the end of the movie, I was, I'd kind of figured out that that's where it was going. And I was pretty disappointed to the point where when the credits actually, actually rolled, the first thing I said was, well, that was dumb. like like the way that the movie ended for me it it took away anything that was scary previously before that so i i feel like this movie would suffer on rewatch at least for me just because Mm -hmm. of that because i think the entire time i'd be watching it on a second or third watch i i'd be anticipating the the ending that was going to come that that i didn't like the first time around but because the performances were really good i liked the way it was shot um, I liked the idea of it, the, of this house that like actually changes and, and, and all that was really good. So I'd give it uh three out of five jars of not peanut butter. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Now, okay. Be- not to ruin anything, but are we to assume that that's who it was the whole time? Cause it can't be in the beginning because, well, uh, you know what? I'm going to actually cut my review short just so we can get on with this. But I think to answer your question, I think that uh, this particular house is sort of where you end up. And that's why they say that the house finds you. Totally. But at the end, I think they alluded to. OK, I'll, I'll ask you later because I don't know. I got to look on the cast and find out who played this person. You don't know in makeup. I no, I think, but it couldn't have been that person the whole time. I think it was. Matter of fact, Gail's like, oh, that's blah, blah, blah. But that but in the beginning, why would that person be there when he held that girl up by her the neck? Because that's Kevin Bacon dreaming. He's talking, think- he's reaching out to Ke- to uh Kevin Bacon through his dreams. So or yeah. it's maybe, yeah, I see what you're saying. Maybe it could just be um without getting into detail of things, the haunting thought. That's just sticking with somebody. But the other thing is, though, is that if you recall at the end of the movie, when they show the on the website, like things change like vacant. You know what I mean? So I'm thinking that it might just be 
I don't want to give it. I don't want to give away this movie because I do think it's worth right, a go, watch. Go, go, go. Done, but done, I just done, think done. that it might be the house. Just to keep it simple, the house calling certain individuals there to, you know, <laughs> to to do what happened to him. And I know that's very very cryptic, but I I don't want to ruin this for you guys. Unless okay. we were going to go for a full on spoily conversation, I don't want to ruin it for the listeners. So what do you think? What did you what 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 did you think about this movie? Um, I thought it started off very strong. I thought it was a little intense. I I liked it actually. I mean, I thought that the acting was really good. I'm a big fan of Amanda Seyfried as well as Kevin Bacon. Uh, the little girl was surprisingly very good too. Yeah. You know, she just uh, I don't know. I just I bu- I bought it. Sometimes I don't buy it with little kids in movies, but I bought it with her. I thought she was a very strong little actress. Um, the ending, much like how Joe feels, I thought it was a little lame. I, that's where I thought that it didn't really stick the landing. And I agree with Joe that the rewatchability may go down a bit. That said, I still think this is a is a pretty decent movie, but decent is the key word I'm talking about. Uh, maybe we should talk about this at another time and kind of get into it. But again, it's, it's just one of those things where I think that if you guys just rent this movie or watch this movie, however you go about things, you'll see what we're talking about, even though we're being kind of cryptic right now. It's a it's not a difficult movie to figure out. Really, I didn't think it was. Uh, one of the most uncomfortable parts for me was Kevin Bacon listening to his actress wife play out parts. Uh, on the set, mm-hmm. you know what I'm talking about? Knowing what's going on in the background. So that's a whole other story that you guys can find out. I'm going to say this movie was just kind of like run of the mill, dude. Like it was, it was fine. I didn't, uh, I'm not going to like recommend everybody watches it, but I do think it's worth a watch, but I'm not going to hate on it either. I'm going to go right down the middle and give 2.5 out of five creepy Polaroids. Now you would, would you recommend, would either of you recommend listeners paying $19 for this? That's a good question. Personally, well, what do you think, Joe? Yeah, we ended up buying it and being my wife and I watched it so we could, you know, rationalize that out to it was $10 a piece. That would have been comparable to going to the theater. Um, just one person watching it by yourself. It, it, <laughs> did, you, did you just get paid? Is it payday? Like, yeah, exactly. It's like, whoa. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you're a huge Kevin Bacon fan or a big Amanda Seafried fan or something, I, it, uh, I, I didn't walk away from it feeling like, oh fuck, I wish I wouldn't have spent twenty dollars on that, or or even rationalizing out at ten, you know. But you know, maybe, maybe, because <laughs> I mean, twenty dollars for a single movie that you're just renting, you know, is a little steep if you're just watching it by yourself. Yeah, call some friends over, pitch in, yeah. save your cans yes. up. That way, you don't have I, to, you know, just save all your bottles and cans, and then when you get to twenty bucks, rent the movie. Yes. And this is a, here's this, the good thing about this sort of horror movie is it's a great horror movie for folks who don't like horror movies. Fantastic. Like if you have somebody over, like, Hey, we're going to all watch this, uh, ho- uh, horror movie. They're like, Oh, we don't, Oh, don't worry about it. You start this movie. They're like, Oh, this wasn't a horror. Yeah, It's movie. entry level. Yeah. Very. And it's digestible. It's, oh, and then you, it's a movie that you could talk to each other while it's on and not being worried about, wait a minute, what happened? You were talking. No, it's not one of those where you had to really pay attention. It's just a fun, a fun, just watchable movie, a romp, the house idea, because normally they do these haunted houses. This was that, but it didn't look it. And I loved that. Yeah, the house was the best part of the movie. I think. Totally. <laughs> yeah. Kind of a TARDIS, if you the, will. The little things it did, there's little things it did. I thought it was just very, very impressive. And I, unlike my two awesome gentlemen over here, I thought the ending, like it had me actually thinking after it went off. I was like, oh, dude, what if you could choose whether or not to suffer consequences alone? What if you could just choose not to and be like, oh, I'm going to try to you know, do this thing. I thought it was interesting. I was like, oh, that's interesting. You know, it's all subjective, right? Yes. And also we have a lot like in our bonus episode, which we need to get Stark on in Shanks. We need to talk spoilers because I have questions that I just don't understand. Y'all are going to explain it to me. Some of the ending. Like, I'm like, wait, what? How did this happen? You're all going to have to break it down for me. We can talk spoilers on here too, but I think we should probably warn people. And since we were doing like a quick blast through it, we didn't talk oh, yeah. about them so much. At least I don't yeah. think we did. Maybe I gave something away. I tend to. That's kind of a bad on my part. <laughs> but other than that, I think it's time for us to say adieu because uh, yes, Mr. Steve has to get to work. Joe, thank you so much for coming on, dude. Like this was great. I mean, honestly, I could have just talked about all the stuff we were talking about on the first half of the show and just kept it that way, but <laughs> we didn't watch movies. So we figured we would, you know, include that in, but, um, can you let these people know where they can find you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
You can check me out on StartCast, which is just long-form conversation. Uh, honestly, a lot of my episodes sound like what we did for the majority of this episode. Right. Where it's yeah. just, you know, whatever comes up, we just, that's what we talk about. Um, I've, I've had Dan on for an episode fairly recently, and we had a lot of fun. Uh, looking forward to getting Steve in on one. I'm going to keep you to that, buddy. I so can't wait for that. <laughs> and uh, my, but the other show that, that I, I do is Number One Comic Books. And I have uh, three other co-hosts on that. And it, it's kind of like a book club where we each pick out a, a new Number One Comic Book. We, we all read the books and then we discuss the, the four books and give a recommendation on whether or not we think it's worth you know going out and spending your hard-earned money on. Who are your co-hosts, bud? Uh, we got Brian from Pop Culture Leftovers, uh, Rebecca from Picard Cast, and uh, uh, Rod. Uh, Rod did a podcast for a while called Turn It Up to Eleven. I don't know if it's available anymore, but it, but he did a Stranger Things podcast, and and Rod's also been on uh, lots of the Comic Talk episodes of Starcast. Rod was at C two E two, wasn't he? He was. I, I didn't know it. I was talking to him, and I didn't know that's who it was. So I felt bad. So on the <laughs> chance you ever hear this, I apologize, Rod. I should have just acknowledged you and, 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 you know, told you you do a damn good podcast. So sorry. Rod's a good guy. <laughs> yeah. He seems like he was a nice guy to talk to, man. I just was, I didn't put it together until afterwards. Yeah. And dude, thank you so much for, for having me on. I mean, you guys are legit. One of my favorite podcasts. I love you guys. And, and this has been so much fun talking with you. Oh, likewise, dude. I'm really glad you came on. We've been talking about this for what? A couple months now. And I'm glad that it finally happened. Our schedules are weird sometimes and it takes us longer to get guests on, but I'm glad that you're here. I think this was a really awesome episode and yes. Joe, we'll be talking to you again real soon. Oh, we got to do it. We have to do it. Like I said, we need a crazy looking Ramirez, Steve Stark. Shanks cast. <laughs> yeah, that would be so much fun. All right, Kevin. <laughs> just talk about DMT and getting blazed and why it works and how it works with our <laughs> system and how the crap my boy Stark could go out there and be like, ah. I ate like 18 mushrooms, felt a little weird next day, rough day, but next, you know, no big deal. I want to know why that is possible where I could take a slice of one and probably puke like I was in the freaking, oh, uh, what was that? What was that uh, one movie where the puppets were puking all over the place? America. Oh, what was that movie? Team America. Team America. I'd be like Team America after one slice. So I want to know the difference <laughs> and why it affects. So we're going to all, we're going to, we need to all come together and figure out how we can do that. Uh, Dan says it's easy. Apparently, we'll see. I think it's going to be easy. Is that so wrong? Okay. I think it's going to be okay. They're good guys. They like to podcast. They're podcasters, Steve. It's not going to be hard. Well, then let's do it. All right, let's do it. <laughs> All right, that's you, man. You're up. That's it. And the last, the next voice you're going to hear is the man that knows everything medically, Dan Ramirez. Guys, this was a fun one. I hope you guys enjoyed this one as much as I did. I, I just love Joe. He's fantastic to talk to. I think you guys are going to get that on this one. We'll be back next week. There's a whole bunch of stuff that we really didn't get to. There's some more reviews we can talk about. Um, I'll be talking about Warrior Nun. I watched a screener on that, and I can't talk about that yet until next week. What else? Uh, oh, we have a bunch of iTunes reviews we didn't get to. We asked you guys to help us out and send the iTunes reviews, and you did. And this is a rarity for us, so I kind of want to read them. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm happy that you guys did that because you said nice things. I appreciate that. Other than that, we'll be back soon. Hollering in your ear, laugh. See, you're going to hear Steve laughing in your ear, and I'll say something about dicks and butts and stuff like that. That's how this show works. My name is Dan Ramirez. That's Steve Hudson. The guy over there, see him? There he is. That's Joe Stark. We are the Heroes of Noise. Even Joe today, he's the Heroes of Noise. We bid you adieu. People, be good to yourselves. Be good to the people around you. Peace. Peace. <laughs>